All right, good evening, everybody. This is the uh, joint meeting, the Planning and Development Subcommittee and Town Council on April 11th, 2019. Time is 6.08. We are videotaping this, uh, doing Facebook Live, and we're also uh, taking minutes for this evening. So agenda item number one, consider and accept the Planning and Development meeting minutes of February 11th, 2019. Second. I'll, I'll second. But well, you weren't here, right? Abstaining. abstaining. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. This time, I'll have two abstaining because you weren't here as well, right? So, I'll be voting in favor for the minutes. One. Um, It'll be one, zero, and two. We're two of abstaining. Uh, agenda item number two, review the town manager's recommendation to appoint Ray Arnold to the Southbridge Trails Commission, effective immediately through June 30th, 2020. And vote to recommend to the council for confirmation. Second. All right. We don't have the town manager here this evening, so I'll go over a little bit. I know Mr. Arnold for uh, actually the last nine months, him and I have been talking extensively about him joining multiple uh, boards here within the town. Uh, it's taken a little bit of time. We finally had an opening of this, um, of the Trails Commission, and uh, he was the first one on that list. Um, the town manager highly recommended Mr. Arnold for this position. Um, is there any other discussion at all? Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? 3-0 passes. Sir, Mr. Arnold, um, I set the date already. I'll be at the town council meeting here in, uh, not, is it next? 22nd. 22nd, thank you. All right, agenda item number three, presentation by Green Meadows regarding the present, or the present marijuana status in the Commonwealth, including data on revenue, safety, and security comparison between medical dispensaries and combined medical adult use dispensaries around the state and Southbridge specifically. Um, tonight I have uh, Mr. Patton here and I'm gonna mess up your name, Chris, so your last name is Iwaki. I'm here to present this evening uh, for uh, Green Meadows, but it's more of an educational presentation to the, to the subcommittee. Um, I invited him here, we've talked multiple times um, about our situation here in the town. And uh, they are also, just for the record, they are also, uh, Green Meadows is putting a medical dispensary over by Fins and Tails and uh, on Main Street. And I just wanted to invite them here to educate us a little bit um, because we are in a different situation because the town in 2017 had voted to prohibit adult use or recreational use. I also invited the chiefs here the health inspector, economic and planning directors um, to give us a little bit of their feedback as well um, because this may be something down the road for the town to, to look at as far as economic um, development within our town. So and with all that said, uh, please, Mr. Patton, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor Adams. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming this evening and all uh, everyone here in attendance for coming this evening. Uh, again, I'm Bob Patton. I'm CEO of Green Meadows Farm. Uh, with me tonight, Chris Sawaki uh, is our COO, um, also my stepson. I always say that um, uh, with great pride. Um, and we have with us also Amy Wildman is our uh, dispensary uh, manager. So Amy, uh, for the uh, medical dispensary for which we're now seeking a special permit in Southbridge, is the face of our, of our, of our company down on uh, Mill Street. Um, and she's a wonderful person, and I hope you all get a chance to speak with her um, uh, tonight. She's, uh, as I say, she'll, she's the manager of dispensary operations and truly the face of our company in the day-to-day, -day, and I think a wonderful representative. Also, I have Phil Silverman, our attorney from Vicente Setterberg Law Firm, uh, a nationally uh, known uh, law firm with specializing in cannabis compliance and regulation and safety and security concerns. Um, as you said, uh, Counselor, tonight is about education. Um, Lord knows I've been on a steep education learning curve since in the 18 months that I've uh, uh, approached this business. 
Uh, I won't go into it too much, but as you know and some know, we started out as an organic farm up north of Boston, and about a year and a half ago, we decided to enter the medical marijuana space as a grower, and that's what we're doing up in Hamilton, Mass., where we um, have a, um, a greenhouse uh, in the same permitting process there. Um, you can see it. In this picture, it's a 65,000 square foot hybrid greenhouse. Hybrid meaning that it's not an indoor warehouse grow, but it's, uh, you can see the polycarbonate or clear roofs where we'll do the growing. It's organic, and it is a wholesaler. And a key point to bring up, uh, in Hamilton, Hamilton is a medical-only town. Uh, not unlike Southbridge in that regard. Uh, it's different as a business matter for us because as a wholesaler, from there we can integrate and work out uh, business relationships with medical providers around the state. Um, so we have, we have a good deal of operating leeway within the medical space out of that wholesale facility. Uh, unlike um, uh, where, where we would have maybe a dispensary in a medical only town where by our mutual decision and mutual embrace, we, we recognize the laws of the town and would be strictly in the medical uh, space in a town like Southbridge. So a little bit more confined as to our um, customer base uh, as opposed to Hamilton Mass where we have a, a medical only um, stricture upon us and of course we honor that 100% up there. So just these early pictures is just to show you for those that aren't familiar with what we're planning and permitting um, down at the intersection of Mill Street, Canal Street, Pleasant Street, and Main, uh, between Fins and Tails and Mill Street. Um, and this is the exterior of our proposed um, construction. It will be 3,500 square feet. It's going to be beautiful inside uh, with 14 uh, foot high ceilings. Um, I would like to take a minute to introduce Phil who could talk a little bit about um, just the security inside a facility like that. Um, again, it's not quite what we want to dwell on, but a little overview of what's inside, um, which of course will be available in its entirety to the law enforcement locally, um, all the security apparatus, the people, the cameras, etc. But Phil Silverman could take a moment to explain the security that's in there. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Phil Silverman. I'm from the law firm of Vicente Cedarberg. My law firm is actually the only national law firm that specializes only in cannabis. That's all we do. Um, and we have offices all over the country. I work out of the Boston office. I uh, have about 100 clients in Massachusetts, and we've been involved in the Massachusetts program. We helped uh, write the law in Colorado. We helped write the law in Massachusetts. And what we really specialize in is compliance. Um, if you believe that uh, you know, medical marijuana is a good thing, if you believe in legalization, you also have to believe that it's important to do it right. It's important to make sure that products that you produce are not diverted to uh, minors, not diverted to people that aren't supposed to be getting a hold of it, and that's really what we do. We, uh, we work with clients, we help them develop uh, procedures for safeguarding their product, security procedures, uh, we audit their records, we do sneak inspections to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do, not just when they know we're coming or that the inspectors are coming, but really all the time. Um, and, you know, it, uh, we've explained to the client it costs a little bit more to use somebody like us, but there are benefits. Um, you know, they are successful. They run a compliant business. The town gets a responsible operator, uh, and the town reaps uh, financial benefits from it as well. Um, I'd just like to touch, you know, whether we're talking, again, medical or, uh, or recreational adult use, um, about some of the security procedures, and I know you're probably somewhat familiar with this because you've been dealing with this issue a little, but I think it's important to reiterate whether we are talking medical or we are talking adult use, uh, the stringent procedures that Massachusetts requires. It's the strict, strictest regulatory regime in the country, and it's, and it's been working so far. Um, and, and so again, you'll see in this what, you know, what we call the limited access facility. You can't set foot in this facility uh, without showing an ID outside. And then when you walk in, you walk into what's called a sally port. Um, uh, in the prison context is where that came from. Uh, it's a, the door closes behind you and you cannot get through the next door without showing that identification uh, to the security personnel uh, in there. Um, similarly, uh, when you do, uh, you, you'll get into a sales area, but, you, but as a customer, you won't have access to any other part of that facility. It's all locked up. Even the employees 
uh, of that facility, it's, it's limited access for them as well. So for example, um, you may have somebody that you know, has an administrative job working in an office. Um, they'll have a key card that uh, they use to get around the facility, but they can't, for example, get to the secure vault in that facility. Their card won't work there because they don't need to be near the vault. Uh, and so that's sort of how a, a limited access facility works. You can only get where you, in your capacity, need to get. Um, cameras everywhere in this facility. All around the exterior, you have to have a 360 degree view outside so you can see everybody coming and going, have operational awareness. On the interior, every door, every window, uh, and every room where any marijuana is handled or stored has to have a camera. Um, you also have what's called a seed to sale tracking system uh, in a dispensary, and what that is is uh, the moment a product comes through the door here, um, it's barcoded and uh, it's inventoried. So you know, for example, that that package that just came in uh, has a half ounce of marijuana in it. And it's constantly inventoried, sometimes daily, sometimes weekly, monthly. And so if that package that weighed a half an ounce this week, next week only weighs a quarter of an ounce, the inventory system is going to alert you to that. And then what you do is you go to the cameras and you find out who's responsible for diverting that product. Uh, and the moment you do, that person's terminated. It's a no tolerance policy with respect to diversion uh, under Massachusetts law. So uh, we're very serious about that as well. Uh, at the end of the day, all of the product that's on um, the sales floor, and again, you can't, it's not really on the sales floor in the sense that customers can go get the product. It's all behind counters, often in a fulfillment area, um, even behind a wall. Uh, but the, even that product um, goes into a secure vault at the end of the day. Not, uh, the, the vault is not utterly impenetrable. If, uh, if somebody wanted to get through to this, you know, after a period of time, they probably could. But the whole point of this is sort of a layered security. Getting in the front door takes time. Getting through the next door takes time. Getting through the next one takes time. Getting into the vault, it is hardened. It's not just a, a you know, a normal wall, but uh, that takes time. And then even within the vault, we keep most of the finished product in safes. So by the time somebody was able to penetrate all of those barriers, um, because of all the cameras and the monitoring, um, the local authorities are going to be well on their way. Uh, and that's why, really, we haven't seen uh, a great deal of, uh, or, or in Massachusetts, any criminal issues thus far uh, surrounding it. It's just not an inviting target uh, for somebody with criminal intent. Uh, there's a dual alarm system. You've got a primary alarm. If that's compromised, there's a backup alarm uh, capable of working uh, on battery, uh, if need be, if somebody were to try to cut the power. Um, all employees at the facility are background checked, uh, and you have on-site security during business hours, uh, and non-business hours, it is monitored 24-7 by an off-site security company. So that's just to give you a, a sense, again, whether we're talking about medical or recreational, of the high degree of security that's going to surround uh, this facility, whether it's just medical or whether uh, we get into the realm of, of adult use recreational as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Phil. I appreciate it. It's, um, he has this knowledge at his fingertips. Um, we've got consultants and security uh, personnel. We are already designed our infrastructure, cameras and such, and uh, by state law, and of course that's how we would operate anyway, that's completely um, integrated um, and made transparent to local uh, law enforcement uh, who have a right at all times to check, to check back cameras, uh, and that relationship, it's always, it's a partnership. I think those that have seen myself and Chris, and now Amy, uh, as we introduce ourselves, increasingly to Southbridge, it's a partnership on multiple levels. Of course, it's a financial partnership, we'll talk about that, but it's a partnership about uh, doing the right thing. Uh, it's a new product, it, uh, it has its dangers, of course, uh, and that means it, it has its responsibilities, and that's how we approach it and, uh, in going forward together, town and the company. So moving forward now, what I wanted to do in this, oh, oh as a last shot, I, I wanted to show, for those that aren't aware, this is um, what we're proposing and now seeking to permit through the proper authorities in Southbridge. Um, you see the lot in green there. Again, you have a Main Street on your lower left. We are foreseeing a one-way entrance into the um, facility from Main, so we don't create a, a problem with traffic cutting across. It's one way from Main. Uh, Mill Street's on the right, uh, and then to Canal, uh, and then our two-way entrance exit is on the Canal there, uh, and then from there out to Pleasant Street and, and, and away. Um, 
what you see in two different examples here. The first lot was the first one that we put in an option to purchase. Uh, that's 1.1 acre, and uh, we are executing that purchase. Um, I talked for the lawyer today, probably within a week um, for that lot. The other lot that's slightly faded, that came available, it had a very, very large and unpaid tax lien on it, owed to the town of Southbridge. Um, we are stepping in and taking care of that tax lien, and we're going to take that piece of property as well. Um, as you can see, we actually don't need it for our, for our we have more than enough space, um, and how many parking spaces did we count on in the second? Well, the, on, the, on the lot on the left, uh, there's 25 spaces. We could actually add more along the, uh, the driveway in from Maine if we, if we wanted to. That's up to uh, the, the town authorities, uh, public works, etc. But there is plenty of parking there as it is. But the, the advantage of the second lot, as you can see, there are 35 more spaces on that second lot. Um, it's one of the reasons why Councillor Adams and I started speaking. We do want to buy it. We've talked to businesses in the area about we want to make available that space. Our hours are 8 to 8 at the most, so we're done in the evening. There are evening businesses. If they have spillover, there's no, there's no reason for us not to make that available to the town, to, to surrounding businesses. I hear there are other businesses that are looking in the area. I've spoken with some of the owners. There's, this, to us, is, is a beautification uh, for our own property and also for the entire, I, can, I call it a town square, although it's not square-shaped, but the idea of adding those spaces and that greenery, I thought was um, an opportunity for, for us to really do a good thing. Um, but it, it came down also as a question about, well, if, if we're medical only, we understand it's still a good business, but maybe we don't quite need as many spaces. We don't need those extra 35. Maybe we'll sit on that lot and just as, as an expense matter, just sit on it. That's one of the reasons it would help our company to know if, how Southbridge feels about the future. It's, 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 we're not going anywhere. We're, we love this space. We love this town. But that second spot, which we are buying, whether we would develop it right away, is somewhat in the balance. I, I would love to because it it's, would be a fantastic, I think, opportunity for us to um, open the property to neighbors, other businesses, and to beautify the entire area. So we are taking both properties, um, but right now that one's a little on hold as to how fast we would go forward in developing it. Um, now, to, to go forward into what we really wanted to talk about tonight, which was, and this is my own education as well, so if I misspeak, there are people that know more than I that will, that will step in. But I wanted to sort of start in the sort of 80,000 foot level and look down at what's going on in America first of all, and then bring it into what's going on in the Commonwealth uh, in terms of medical marijuana and the adult use market that's, as we all know, is rapidly exploding. Um, and then finally bring it down to the local level of Southbridge and small communities where, again, then uh, Phil can, can, can get up and speak a little bit about what's going on in other small towns and cities uh, in the Commonwealth and what they're experiencing. So let me take you through really quickly. I know there's a lot of info on some of these slides. Um, I'll make them available uh, after the meeting, and, of course, they're available online as well. But what we have here is a very, very quick timeline nationally of how medical Marijuana has come to be legalized state to state and how in more recent years the adult use uh, market has uh, become uh, uh, active. So you see in the red above, above beginning in 1996, uh, California led the way uh, uh, legalizing medical marijuana. Um, it's gone, you know, sort of in a regular way through the years and then in rapid succession we see in 2012 Colorado and Washington. Uh, Alaska, Oregon in 14, Washington, D.C. the next year, um, and then California, November, uh, November, California, Nevada, Maine, and Mass came out in 16. So that's really just the, the timeline of what's going on nationally, and you can see the, uh, the adult use entering into the, the, um, the scene uh, in the last few years. Well, this is a really general bit of information, and we'll touch on uh, more detail on them on the later slides. But to show you what we're looking at here, and these are just the numbers, and it, it, there's also the human element. What does this all mean? And that's so important to all of us here. But these are some of the over, overarching larger facts that we're seeing about some of the revenues, some of the types of users, and what's happening on, and where they're purchasing it. So very quickly, I'll just uh, point out the general 2018 uh, legal cannabis, this is not the black market, which is, remains a problem. This is the legal uh, market of marijuana, whether um, uh, adult use or medical, at about $10.3 billion right now in America in 2018. Um, you can see down below, they're projecting by the year 2025, um, 
if no more legal markets open up, if this was just with no changes, no more states came uh, online or no national legalization came on, if it just stayed where they are, that would have grown to $25.7 billion in one year in 2025. That's the projection. Um, if you add up the years 2018 until then, that would be almost $80 million. Again, not counting on any growth in any other states. That's just uh, given the status quo at current growth rates. Um, upper left, very interesting to me, kinds of things that, that you learn when you get in this business. The biggest growth area relative to all buyers of marijuana, medical or adult use, is 55 and up. Um, they're not the highest volume buyer yet, but in terms of the share of, of, um, of, of where the, uh, the purchasing um, uh, concentration is, lies, it's among 55 and older uh, adults. It's 24% right now and growing. Um, over here in the 67%, those are the people who uh, have self-identified as primarily adult users rather than medical users. Um, you have here the growth in adult youth sales. This is just adult youth nationally from 2018 projected through to 2025. They see it growing um, at 130% from now. Um, and finally, uh, again, this, this interesting number that the growth in retail sales to adults 55 and up. This is, I had never would have thought this. This is the growth area in marijuana right now. For whatever reason, uh, generationally, it somehow has jumped to this, to this older generation, of which I'm a proud member, um, uh, at 50% uh, uh, is the growth since, since the last three years in 55 and olders um, participating in uh, marijuana uh, use. And then this last one is an interesting one, which we're going to get to. But this is the state of affairs right now. People that are buying in communities, people that are buying in communities right now overall are either buying from 40% are buying from friends and 24% from private dealers. That's happening now. Uh, in, in, and well, friends and private dealers, that means illegal sales. So 40% and then 24, so 64% are saying that they do go outside illegal markets to buy marijuana. That's what's happening now. 20%, if it's available in their community, and that would be nationally mostly medical still, 20% will go to a regulated brick and mortar store where the product is, as, as Phil Silverman was saying, is monitored for compliance and regulation, testing so there are no additives and poisons and pesticides in it, and then finally taxed. 20% uh, right now are going to brick and mortar stores if they're available. So click it ahead, Chris. All right, again, this is again, we're at the, the 30,000 foot level here looking at what's happening nationally. Uh, given uh, uh, the markets where they are right now. The lower in the red is the um, medical uh, use as projected out to 2025. Uh, and the upper in the green is what they foresee to be the uh, adult use market. That CAGR number, I have a mental block against remembering what it stands for, but it's compound annual growth rate at about 14% overall. The interesting thing, and this is a very important graph because we will have a Massachusetts graph to compare it to in a moment, but this, right now, the, the reason that the medical is relatively one-to-one -one with the adult use is because this is a national profile. As we saw in that timeline, there is much more available, availability in the states of medical than adult use. But even at the stage of the disparity between medical outlets and adult use, many, many more states have medical legality. Um, it's about a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, and so in Massachusetts, there are projections now based on what's happening, and we'll show that in just a moment. Um, lastly, Market Watch, just one of many um, uh, you know, uh, economic um, um, uh, companies that, uh, that study the markets, et cetera, and trends, predict that by 2030, you could see a national market approaching 90 billion. These are just projections, but it kind of gives you the idea about what is happening out there uh, in America. Um, this is, goes back to who is buying marijuana. Uh, in terms of the latest um, polls that have been taken uh, by the consultants and uh, data companies that we, that we use. Um, and what you see here on this, on this chart, in the lower green are the uh, 31 to 21 year olds, who the, traditionally we would have thought the users of marijuana would be younger, always adult. If they're under adult, they'll put, and they, and they get it from my company, I'm out of business the next day, it will never happen. And we all don't want youth anywhere near this, of course. Um, but you can see a very interesting thing this, if you look at these lines, that's 100% across the country of, of use, medical or adult. This is legal using. Who's using the legal marijuana? We see 
a very solid level of, of 21 to 31, and yet it's trending down relative to the other profiles of purchasers. Who's trending up? Well, 35% of the increase uh, is age 56 and up. Again, kind of a wonder to me. Um, uh, I have visited some of the um, uh, active um, dispensaries and adult use uh, in Massachusetts to understand how they operate, to see what they look like, what, how they're, they're set up, the decor, the security. I'm amazed, objectively, there are people that are of all ages there. It's, it's quite, it's the damnedest thing. I would never have suspected it two years ago, but one sees it now borne out in, in, in the, stat, the statistics that the largest group, that, the group that is showing the most growth in use of legal medical or adult use legal, is 55 and up, and then the next is the middle age group, which is, uh, what is it, 30, 36 to 55. So, kind of surprising to me. I would have thought oh, it's going to be 21 to 31. Those are the users. That's not what we're seeing. That's not what we're seeing in these establishments. It's, uh, again, it's, it was a surprise to me, um, but the, the, it was borne out afterward by these, um, these statistics. Go ahead. Again, why are consumers buying it. Well, why do they say they're buying it, at least? And in, in these um, data analytics that were handed to us that we've been uh, using to develop our own um, understanding of the business, this tells you that there may be a group of people that, that take it to get high, and that's always going to be part of why the adult use marijuana is, it has its um, is consumer base. But this is what people are saying. The top three, pain management, anxiety reduction, stress relief, relaxation, that probably gives you an understanding, gives me an understanding of why the middle-aged and older group, 55 and up, are, 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 are turning to this to some degree as part of their lifestyle. They are getting, as the medical users have gotten for many years, a wellness benefit that they attribute to, to, to wellness. Um, and again, when, when you visit, and I do it as a businessman, these um, other facilities that are opening in Massachusetts, you see this sense of composure, and quietness and exchange, young and old speaking, and so many come and say, yes, it's part of, uh, I have pain management, relaxation, sleep is a big one, uh, insomnia for medical, but also apparently for adult use. So again, an interesting fact, and I'm just trying to give an education, this is the kind of thing I've been learning about, and I thought it would be interesting to all of us here today as well. This is, a, um, uh, where are consumers purchasing uh, marijuana? This goes back to the, uh, slide I showed earlier about um, some are turning to friends and dealers, and this, that's still a significant proportion, but some are going to the regulated areas um, of the brick and mortar um, uh, facilities. The interesting thing here, is, and this was in the other um, slide as well, you see 40 and 24 private dealer friends. Well, that's illegal. Those are illegal markets, we understand. Then on the here, you've got online, I grow my own, uh, and then online deliveries, uh, smaller amounts. This number in the middle is key. And what this over here, we explain it. If there is a medical, legal medical facility in a market, 20% of all the users will go to that store. If there is also an adult use capability in that same market, 44%. This number 20 will go to 44. 44% will now go away from the illegal market, go away from their friends, go away from their private dealer, and will go to that store. They may have to pay a little bit more money because black market is cheaper, but they want to be legal. They want to participate uh, in, in the proper way. And that number is growing uh, in all the states where there is legal. The communities where there is only medical, it kind of stays at 20%, and the other users, we know they're in all the communities, it's been in the part of American society for decades, they're there, they're going to go out and find it. Maybe in another town, but if they find it in their own town, they're going to go to their dealer, they're going to go to their friends, and it's going to be illegal, untested, and untaxed. But if there is an adult use capability in a town, 44% will go to that, uh, between that and the medical dispensary. Again, this was an education to me, and this is what the stats show us. This is kind of hard to read, obviously, but I wanted you all to see the general, uh, why did Green Meadows Farm, who wanted to turn a part of our organic produce farm into medical marijuana production as a wholesaler, we entered the business because we know there's need. And these curves, although they're far away from us, you can see each year the medical marijuana usage is going up. There's it's about 2,000 new patients a month 
register, or at least have been until recently. It's begun to taper off a little bit, and I think probably we can understand why. But it's been a healthy market, um, but it's important to look down here. About 60,000 registered marijuana patients, pardon me, in Massachusetts at the moment. 49 registered medical dispensaries uh, are active in the moment, at the moment, and you have 103 applications for medical dispensaries in the works with the town, 103 medical, like us, like, 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 like Green Meadows. But if one digs into the documentation, and Phil can answer this, those people, those companies are, are seeking to co-locate because that's what most of the towns where they are want for the reasons of regulation, compliance, security, and of course, the share of revenues. As we all know, that's, that's a part of this picture. It's part of the partnership. One little element that did pop up that has been pointed out, all these curves go straight up, and then the last one here, January of 19, it goes down. People are saying, is that the first sign where the availability of adult use will begin to draw off medical users who maybe it's just easier to let my card expire or to let, uh, I'll drive to the near legal adult use facility rather than driving um, 10 miles or 20 miles to, to, the, to the medical facility. So we've seen in other states a pretty pronounced drop. Um, once adult use comes on, the medical just, the, the, the medical use just begins to taper down by the sheer um, pressure of adult use, the sheer availability of it. Um, and so that's something as a CEO of a company, I start to see that and I say, well, okay, we have to measure, you know, we love Southbridge, we're coming, but I start to measure, okay, what am I going to commit for staffing and all that? It's just something that we have to do. Um, but uh, as I say, it's just something in the very earliest blip that we do see that trending down in that first month after uh, adult use sales came online in December of 18. So go ahead, Chris. Here's what's happening right now in Massachusetts in the adult use market. And this is as of this month. And this is um, from the Cannabis Control Commission, which of course is the overarching um, controlling body of marijuana in, in Massachusetts, both medical and adult use, the CCC. We now have, as you can see, 13 adult use retailers are active in Massachusetts, in the Commonwealth. You have a total of 334 applications in the pipeline for adult use establishments. And you can see them by county. And you see over here in Worcester County, I, my eyes fa don't fail me, is that 88? Um, what is it? Is that 88? So 88 are in the works in Worcester County right now, around us. So as I look at this, I say, okay, that's something that our company will have to figure out how to handle. We'll have to somehow make ourselves known as a great medical provider. And even though uh, there are 88 applications for adult use coming in all around Worcester County, hopefully those who need medical marijuana for the, the many real reasons that they do uh, will, will find us. But it's a bit of a challenge and there's no way to, but except to be honest to all of you about that. So we're seeing again 334 applications for adult use establishments are presently in the works, 88 in Worcester County. And lastly, which is another element that we have to factor in, I know, I'm sure that all of you know too, that nationally the trends seem to be going toward legalization. We know that every announced candidate in the Democratic Party has said that they are for national legalization. And even Mr. Trump appears to be um, uh, kind of benign about it, sort of benign neglect, um, uh, has, has pulled uh, his attorney general uh, to, to let the states choose their way and to not seek to enforce the, um, the longstanding um, federal one laws against marijuana. So I won't speak for, for Donald Trump, what he's going to do in the Republican platform, but we know that the Democratic platform uh, and the Democratic candidates are pushing. We know that I believe the last number nationally on a poll was something like 60 some percent of Americans wanted. So we, we feel we know it's coming. So I can say to myself, uh, we're going to very happily, very proudly, very gratefully open a medical dispensary in Southbridge, provided we win our special permit. The adult use will come some, at some point because it will be national, I assume. Um, that seems to be the trend that we're seeing. The issue that arises to a business such as ours is the time that it would take to then change and renew our application to add adult use. The sheer backlog in Massachusetts with the CCC now says you could have the most pristine, 
application in the world. The best finances, the best crew, the most moral people, the absolute, uh, the, you know, the, the, the most premier group of, of operators that you could have, and it could still take the CCC a year and a half to approve you in the adult use space, simply because of backlog. So something that I can only acknowledge honestly to Southbridge is when and if Southbridge were to ever to say, you know, maybe this time that we uh, admit adult use uh, into the town, and then they come to Green Meadows, and let's say we're now operating very happily our medical dispensary, but maybe struggling a little hard to get our, uh, to get our clientele in there, and you say, you know, the votes happen, we'll change it up, and you can now apply to us to do this, that's great. We'd be grateful because as a business, it probably would be high time. It would be probably difficult knowing what the state of affairs would be uh, in the country and in Massachusetts, but we're still talking another year and a half to get approved. So that becomes something that I have to think about in terms of our company. Again, we'll be here proudly, gratefully, but that's something I have to, I have to think about. Um, we had another graph about what's happening nationally relative to um, the adult use market relative to the medical uh, uh, market, the longer established medical market. Um, adult use is fairly new and it was kind of even up nationally, but we understand why that is, is because there aren't as many states that have legal adult use as have legal medical use. So it was pretty much 50-50, but in Massachusetts the projections are otherwise. And this is what is foreseen to be coming in Massachusetts in terms of the, um, the impact that adult use availability and legality will have on the medical market. Um, and you can see uh, they start in 2014, but they move through and they have medical use projected where they are here at 2020, a year from now, uh, and then you see above what recreational will mean. Um, that obviously has implications to a company like mine as revenue. It also has implications to the towns that will have adult use facilities in their towns. They will then be, be participating in that, that red up there that a medical provider would not be. And that's just, again, a, a fact of, of, of existence now in this industry in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So this is a pretty important um, thing that I, as a, as, a, as a CEO, have to figure out how we're going to negotiate this. Um, we will, but it'll be difficult. It will be difficult. Um, I have a mistake on this page, which I'll correct, and I apologize for it, but um, this is just a general overview. Again, I didn't know any of this <laughs> not too long ago, and I'm learning it now, uh, but this is the general marijuana taxation uh, regimen in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, and I'll tell you where my mistake is in a moment. But let's take a medical registered uh, dispensary over on the left, such as Green Meadow Southbridge would be un under the current, the current rule. 3% of our annual gross revenue, i.e. write out whatever the cash register showed at the end of the year, 3% of that, no deductions, nothing, goes to the town, the city of Southbridge for its own use in ways that it wants. And this is a negotiated host community agreement. This is what we've done. That 3% is standard. That's the maximum allowed by uh, the Commonwealth and the CCC. 3% of annual gross revenue. In addition, it varies town to town, but in, in uh, working with the town council, working with a town manager, um, uh, Ron San Angelo, uh, we came up with an additional $20,000 annual contribution to be made to um, uh, charities, initiatives, fund drives, uh, public events, uh, public safety, at the town's discretion uh, for community betterment, an extra $20,000. Um, where I fall short here, I have the 6.25 sales tax falling over on the, on the adult use side. Phil corrected me this evening, 3% of that, is that correct, Phil? 3% of that sales tax from the gross annual sales also go back to the town. There is no sales tax on the medical. Marijuana. So a town like Southbridge or any other which has a medical only dispensary will get 3% of the annual gross revenue. They will not get the 3%, uh, an additional 3% unless it's an adult use store. Um, I don't have it in here. That's a huge number. It doubles the take, obviously, uh, that would go to the town um, from uh, a retail establishment uh, such as what we're putting up in Southbridge. So that's obviously a, a, a huge factor. If you're looking at market and revenue, I always say, and we've got it down here, this is a partnership. Early in the days when these were being negotiated, um, in years past, many towns opted for just a number. 
give us $200,000 a year, and that will be our take. And that probably worked out well, maybe in the beginning, but certainly if they become adult use, that's probably light. But what I don't like about it, those set fees, it reduces the partnership element. It just says, you, give a, you cut a check and go do your business. When you have a participation of an indexed fee uh, based on your revenues, 3% being taxes, 3% um, uh, of um, the, um, uh, uh, the mitigation fee, the impact fee, pardon me, that is a true partnership. If our company does it right, complies, is regulated, is a good neighbor, is, is hand in hand with law enforcement, making sure that we are, are, are doing it correctly, and we are producing revenue for ourselves and for the town, that's the partnership. And if we stumble and fail, shame on us, but the town will suffer if we stumble and fail, God forbid, and if we succeed and do well as a medical provider, as a medical and or adult use provider, that link is, 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 is like this. And to me, that's the best way to go forward because at every level, regulation, compliance, safety, security, and yes, indeed, revenues, you're, you're joined. You rise and fall together, and no one uh, uh, can, can say that the, that the company was not a true uh, joined-at-the-hip partner with the town and with the community. So that's, that's clearly the best um, way to set up, uh, I think, an ACA, and that is indeed how it was constructed with the uh, town council in Southbridge, with the help of the councilors there, the advisors, uh, Rosemary Scrivens, and, and others in her office, and of course, Ron. Uh, all, uh, terrific. Uh, the negotiation was, was very simple because it was done with just a great deal of transparency and openness and we were thrilled to, to be admitted uh, and, and to gain that executed HCA. Back to what's happening on the adult use side again. There's, it's, the adult use marijuana is taxed. Medical marijuana is not, except for the 3%. So you have 6.25 sales tax going to the Massachusetts General Fund. This is my mistake. 3% back to the municipality to a total of 6%. 10.75% is an excise tax. That goes to the, uh, the CCC's Marijuana Revenue Fund. And that fund, among other things, pays for the CCC's expenses, public awareness campaigns, obviously anti-drug campaigns, primarily safety, security, substance abuse prevention and treatment, youth education, public safety, municipal police training. I'm going to speak about that a little bit. I, um, uh, and some of the new um, issues that are coming up with um, uh, uh, police and this industry partnering. And of course, Massachusetts Prevention and Wellness Trust Fund, which is also managed by the CCC. So that's where that 10.75% is going. Um, adult use also pays 3% to the host community. And then this last number, um, I tried to go through. There was um, an overview of about 34 recent HCAs that were signed and looked into. And when you move into the adult use market, and let's just posit that at some point, Southbridge were to come to Green Meadows and say, whether it's sooner or later, we think adult use is probably happening all around us. We want to renegotiate the HCA. Well, that is indeed a renegotiation. The 3%, would, would, it's fixed. You can't go higher than that. The 3% of sales tax is also fixed. The number that, that, can, that can be changed and has been changed, we have a $20,000 um, uh, donation. Uh, thrilled to do it. We can't wait to see the good things it's going to do. But adult use drives more revenue. There are more uh, impacts to mitigate and to understand with the drug awareness, the fact that we, you know, we need to under, uh, have parents and youth understand that this is something new, something dangerous, and has to be regulated. So that extra number, I'm seeing, it varies. I've seen 20,000, but I've seen well over 100,000. That's open to negotiation uh, in adult use communities. So you're talking 6% of revenue, of, of the gross revenue from the facility, and then some determined amount uh, beyond that, um, and generally in adult use situations, we see upwards of $100,000 extra. Uh, issues that have arisen. You can never speak about marijuana, uh, adult use or medical, without acknowledging that there are issues that must be uh, the top priority above everything, above revenue, above uh, all, those, all those things that are, that are fine to talk about. It's the fact of the substance itself that we need to take care of and be aware of. We've all read, I think, um, uh, the early facilities that opened up in Northampton, Leicester, and some others, they had, they had traffic jams. Uh, it was a novelty. It was new. People were coming from out of state. Yes, that's a big part of, of the market. Um, and location near a state border is probably going to attract um, uh, users is simply a fact. Um, 
but nevertheless, it created traffic jams and they were, I guess, pretty horrific in the beginning. I mean, and, and the local townspeople, while they might like the revenue, they might like the operators, they might trust the business, they were upset about the traffic. Uh, that can be mitigated in a number of ways, but time above all will mitigate it as now there are 13 instead of just two, and we're already hearing that the traffic is, is, is considerably mitigated. To harken back to the, the spot that we have uh, our, our, to purchase here in Southbridge, with 35 on the adjacent lot lots and 25, I believe, on our lot, that's a lot of parking. Um, and uh, given that there are 334 other applications in, we know that there are going to be a lot of adult use establishments. They're not all going to pour into Southbridge as they did into Northampton in those first days. But traffic is an issue, and we, of course, would coordinate in whatever way with town law enforcement, traffic control to make sure that wasn't an issue and we'll, we'll know more uh, going forward. And in the medical space too, we need to make sure that we're an absolutely good neighbor to all the businesses and residents around uh, in the blocks surrounding us. Illegal black market marijuana, that is still a big issue. Um, the, the argument for legalization was it will drain away the black market, um, which has been in existence as we all know for decades. And we know that money goes to, to bad actors. Um, it's still going on in Massachusetts. Now, the reason it's going on is because black market marijuana is cheaper. Because if you're not in the medical space, you are paying taxes. You're paying 17% extra taxes, as well as the 3% to the towns. So the price of marijuana is going to be cheaper if you are a dealer, you know, in, in a back alley, uh, than if you are coming into a brick and mortar store and doing it uh, in front of cameras and under the lights and doing it correctly. That is giving the black market a little more durability, but we are seeing the black market fade. Just as you saw 20% of users where there was a, 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 an availability of, of medical will go to the brick and mortar, and when there's an availability of an adult use brick and mortar, legal store, it goes to 44%. That's draining from the black market. That's, that curve is, is going in the right direction, I'm happy to say, in all the states, but we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Black market marijuana remains a problem, uh, and it, it will simply take time. Uh, and so, but we have to acknowledge that. Public safety, of course, it's an issue. Uh, the CCC and Massachusetts law enforcement are working together all the time to study the, the still unfolding public safety ramifications from traffic to whatever else might be going on. And, and Phil can talk about what's going on or frankly what hasn't been going on in the Commonwealth as far as crime related to this. Um, but they're working together because this is such a new industry to form, formulate What's happening? How do we detect, uh, for example, um, the number one issue on so many of our minds, um, driving under the influence. Um, alcohol, terrible scourge, you know, driving drunk. Marijuana also can impair. The ability of law enforcement to discern is, is, is they're, they're, I know they're, they're law enforcement that know, have experience and can pick it up in two seconds, but they're working with the CCC to find out the procedures, the responses, the technologies that can be used to identify uh, that kind of violation. So that's, that's been part of the, published just uh, two months ago, three months ago, the baseline review of um, assessment of cannabis use and public safety. They did a full study of how much they could detect marijuana infecting mostly traffic issues, driving under the influence over the last seven years to get a baseline so then they can figure out behaviors, changes, what's happening. It's a new industry, but they are acknowledging it as something that has to be figured out. Uh, and again, no one will be a greater partner in that effort than any marijuana company, whether medical or retail, uh, adult use, because that is a scourge upon us, and nobody wants a business such as ours to be given a, 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 to be a bad neighbor, to be responsible for that. It's an ongoing and probably never-ending concern, just as alcohol has been in driving, but it's something that we acknowledge, and, and, and it's very, very important to all of us. Um, and then finally, there's a, 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 there's a, a new, uh, more about marijuana, which is a new um, uh, undertaking by the CCC and the DPH and the Bureau of Substance Abuse uh, to, again, use the funds that are going to start coming in uh, to, to create a balance uh, to marijuana that's been part of our society for, so, for decades. And to, and to, again, do it right and to use these new funds to, to mitigate and to educate and to um, uh, put a bright light on what has been a, a, a shadowy uh, business for decades. Uh, neighborhood crime. Uh, 
Phil can speak to this, and I'm, in fact, I'm going to invite him up here just now after, sorry for my long-windedness, my, my son always teases me about it, but uh, try, I'm trying to get, get the information out to all, all of us, and uh, then we'll open it up to questions. But um, I think I can speak, and I'm going to let Phil correct me. There's essentially, in, through the medical, years of medical legality in Massachusetts, and in the, in the recent months of, of uh, adult use, we simply haven't seen anything of significance. So Phil, can I have you come up and talk about what you've seen as a, as a law firm and, and, and are, about crime in these areas or non-crime uh, in these areas? And, and whatever points I missed up to, uh, okay. Phil will, will, will okay, correct I, I will uh, just sort of reiterate on the crime side. Uh, there are a lot of studies right now that are showing that crime goes down um, where marijuana facilities are available because uh, of what I was talking about before. There is just such a significant degree of security here. And it is important for these companies to make sure that the surrounding area is someplace that's safe and welcoming, both for medical patients and uh, recreational consumers. They have to police that area. All of the cameras around, they have to be on the lookout. Are there people loitering here? What these companies actually do, you know, everybody sort of has a fear, well, somebody's going to come in and they're going to take their product and go out and they're going to use it right outside. Not with these companies, because these companies, their license depends on this, okay? They have monitors, the cameras are out there, they have monitors in, in the parking lots. Uh, we spend a lot of time, we also spend a lot of time educating uh, patients and, and uh, customers here. You know, the first time they come in, we sit them down. It's a, usually a 15-minute visit to the dispensary. This one's about 30 minutes because we spend 15 minutes explaining, look, here's what responsible use is about. If you want to have the benefit of coming and having legal, regulated marijuana, having all these different types of products that you can't find from the black market, having safe products, you have to be a responsible user. You can't take this when you drive. You can't just take this outside and use it outside. You can't sit in the parking lot in your car and you use it. Take it home. That's the best place to, do, to use you know, these products. And so we spend a lot of time doing that, and we're very vigilant. You know, we get a call from, some, from a neighbor saying, there's a guy outside that just came in and I, you know, came, came out of your place, and I can see that he's using we know who that person is, okay? We've seen that person's ID. We know who we've sold it to. That person will not be allowed back in this dispensary, and if we have the ability, we'll be calling the local police to say you need to go take care of this because it's not helpful to this business, and the regulations require us to do it. So these have been very uh, safe businesses. I'm going to get off the crime for a second and talk um, a little bit. Bob's done a very nice job of giving you a very broad overview of what... Um, sort of the marijuana market is uh, nationally and in Massachusetts. I'm going to try and bring it down to Southbridge, uh, if I can. Um, and, and to do that, you know, I'll sort of touch on uh, some issues that impact that, just so you understand them. Um, the first thing that I think we all have to figure out, and, and Bob has mentioned this, uh, is the viability of medical marijuana in Massachusetts. What is that what is the future of that program? And, and I would be dishonest if I didn't tell you that there's some serious questions here about that. It's one of the reasons I've spent a lot of time trying to advise Bob about uh, the, the wisdom of opening a medical-only uh, operation in this area. Um, uh, the, the fact is, uh, from a company's perspective, to get a medical marijuana license, uh, it's a significant application process you get that on the recreational side too. But the license fees are $50,000 a year to get a medical marijuana license to operate as a company, okay? On the recreational side for a dispensary, it's about $5,000 a year. Why that is is beyond me. I think it should be exactly the opposite way, but it isn't, okay? So if you want to be medical, that $50,000 a year is a significant burden. Um, now let's take it from a different perspective, the patient perspective. Uh, in order to be allowed into a medical dispensary, patient has to go first to a doctor, okay? So you're going to have to pay the doctor to diagnose you and to make a recommendation. Then you have to take that recommendation. You have to go to the Cannabis Control Commission. You have to pay them a fee uh, and get a medical card. And that's what you need to bring to the medical dispensary. And you have to do those two things, go to the doctor, get your medical card every year, okay? So... There's a question as to how many of these patients 
when they look at, well, all right, why would I go through all of that hassle when I can just walk over to a medical and not have to do that? Well, the answer is that on a adult use marijuana, there's a 20% tax that you don't have to pay uh, under the medical program. But is that going to be enough? Are people, are patients going to continue to sign up for this uh, under those terms where it's just so easy to walk right in, never have to do anything uh, to get a card and just walk into uh, recreational. And so this is one of the big issues. And I, I should tell you, before I got into the cannabis industry, I was a bankruptcy lawyer for 25 years here in Massachusetts. And I try to give my clients good advice on what to do. And I have been hammering my client over this uh, saying you need to try to compete in both markets. You need to have that availability because we don't know what's happening medically. And Bob is very committed to the medical program and he's very committed to Southbridge. Uh, and I think, you know, like a lot of my clients, I say, you're just a lawyer. What do you know about business? But uh, I, I think this is something that he's got to think about and I will keep hammering it home. But it's something just informationally for you, questions about the medical market. So. Let's just talk for a minute about sort of the recreational market and what that might mean uh, for a place like, like Southbridge. So in terms of the size of that market, uh, the, the best statistic I can give you is that 20% uh, of the population has used marijuana in the last 30 days. So that gives you some idea of what kind of a market uh, there is out there. Exactly what that means um, is, is difficult in the sense that uh, I don't know how many of these dispensaries there are going to be in the surrounding area, okay? Um, you know, I know Palmer, Massachusetts, for example, is not prohibiting it. They're going to have recreational sales. I think Auburn is as well. There is Charlton? Charlton. Okay. Uh, there are others. Um, but I don't know how many they're going to have, how many are actually ever going to get open, because that's been an issue too. It's been very difficult for, for companies to actually get going. So. You know, anything I tell you is a little bit tempered by that. Um, I, I will tell you an, an interesting example, though, in terms of sort of the changing landscape of how this works. Uh, a lot of towns, you know, look at this and say, well, we don't want that in our town. Uh, but the truth is um, prohibiting uh, marijuana doesn't really uh, keep it out of your town. Um, the best example I can give of this is Colorado Springs, Colorado, um, which you may know is a very, it's a pretty conservative town. It's a primarily military town. And they started off and they opted out of uh, legal marijuana. Uh, they didn't want it. Uh, they soon changed their mind because they found out that it really isn't keeping it out. Uh, the black market, to some extent, survives, I think more significantly, they realized that their residents, this 20% of the population I talk about, was just going to other towns, buying it there, bringing it back, and then all of the fees that were associated with that were going to the other town and not to Colorado Springs. And so recently, they've legalized in Colorado Springs as well. Um, they, they deem that the wisest course. So, uh, and, I, and I keep sort of hearkening back to Colorado because I think it's the best example of a mature market as to what might happen. So let me tell you a little bit about that. Colorado right now, the, the average dispensary in Colorado brings in about $3 million a year. Uh, Colorado is just a, about a million people less in population than Massachusetts, so there is some equivalence there. Um, but again, so $3 million a year for your average dispensary. But remember, in Colorado, uh, you have about 1,000 of these dispensaries across the state. Okay? In Massachusetts, in the next three to four years, we don't expect more than 300, maybe 400. You saw there's about 334 applications in Massachusetts. Not all of those are for dispensary. Some of those are for cultivation, product manufacturing operations. So, so the numbers are not going to be what you're seeing in Colorado. So that $3 million average number you're seeing in Colorado, do I think Southbridge will meet $3 million at a rec dispensary? Yes, I do. Uh, do I think $5 million? I would not be surprised at all. $7 million? Maybe. 10 million, not impossible. Uh, again, I, I, those numbers are all a little tempered by how many other places are out there. But again, I, I, I think it's substantial revenues generated by this. And remember, the town is collecting 3% on those numbers as an impact fee and then 3% as a tax. So you're getting 6%. If it's 3 million, you're getting $180,000. 5 million, you're getting 300,000, 7 million, 420,000. If you got to 10 million, you'd be at 600,000. So they're significant numbers. Um, medical 
I think is different if you were to just be medical here, given the landscape that I'm talking about. Patients starting to level off, if not decline. Uh, competition for patients from uh, adult use dispensaries. My guess is you're seeing more like a million to two million dollars a year uh, from a place like that. Okay. Again, I've tried to warn Bob about this and he wants to move forward on medical, but I think uh, there's some issues. And remember, you're not collecting 6% on that, you don't get the, the tax, you're collecting 3% on that, just the impact fee, maybe $60,000 a year, something along those lines. Um, so for a, for a company like Bob, where you're talking about having to put up a million dollars to put a building up and actually in excess of that when you consider all of the security that goes into it, the cameras, the other security protocols, um, it's a significant investment. It's hard, I think, to just operate medically. He's going to do it. He insists he's going to do it. But um, I, I think it makes sense in, from a lot of perspectives to take a good hard look at uh, what recreational sales might do here. Because I think given all of the security uh, and really in a lot of ways the smooth rollout that we've seen other than traffic, which I think is going to go away, um, I think there's a certain amount of sense to it. So thank you. Thanks, Phil. Um, and, I, and I'll head us down to the next slide. Um, I think it's always important. In fact, this is, this is important, uh, sort of a good, good, good place to, to end up. We all know what, what revenues mean to a town. Uh, I live in a small town in Connecticut, and I spend a lot of time up in Hamilton where our, where our cultivation is, and I hope to spend more and more time in Southbridge. Uh, these fees go to good things. And, that, and the point is, we know marijuana is marijuana. It has its dangers, and there are people that should not be anywhere near it, and I don't want in, a, in any of my facilities uh, buying it or cultivating it. But when we say revenues, we do talk about very real things that, uh, that wouldn't be my decision, but the town would decide where, where, where does it need it for, what, what uh, initiatives, what charities, uh, what hires they need to make. Um, and again, so uh, the revenues do mean something, and I know I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know. Uh, they, they matter. Um, at any rate, let's just look down finally at the, um, at the revenues that, that were generated. Um, Massachusetts expected to reap, um, they projected 63 million in tax revenues by uh, June 30th of this year and 133 million in their, their, their take of the revenues by uh, fiscal year 2020. That's actually come in a little bit lower than they thought. It was about 5.9 as of March 1. Uh, and the reason is that they just had a slow rollout. There's only 13 uh, stores and there were really only a couple in the very, very beginning. But what does that mean to a business like ours? It means that the CCC has now been um, directed by the state of powers that be to get busy and to start cranking out adult use. So you saw the 334 establishments, as Phil said, not all are retailers, they're adult use established. Some could be growers, they could be transporters, they could be testers, but it's 340, most of them by far are retailers. Um, and those are going to be fast-tracked because the, the state's a little impatient for the money that they expect to be coming in because they know it's there. They know it's there, it's just a matter of getting uh, operational in these locations. Um, and then let's take it down to the local. I think we all read it, but I think it just has to be acknowledged. Uh, there, the, the, the numbers that I've studied, um, and there are 13 now, but as of March 12th, there were nine uh, adult use, and most of them were co-located, by the way, adult use and medical use. There were nine operating um, in Massachusetts, and in their first three months of operating as an adult use as well, those stores, those nine, generated $45 million between them, nine stores of sales. Um, if you put the 3% HCA calculation on there, that's 1.35 million. Uh, you can double that because we know now, and um, it wasn't written into my deck, it's 6%. So you're talking about $2.75 million was divided among nine, nine towns um, in, in different proportions, but on average. Um, the two earliest that were opened, uh, uh, Cultivate and Lester, and then the, the real, um, the sort of, the most successful of the bunch, the first of the bunch, was New England Treatment Access in Northampton. It's often called NETA. And they were, the, they were the first ones to open, and they just reported what they delivered to the towns just uh, last week. And on April 9th, Lester reported that it had received, in three months, $193,000 from one store, Cultivate, uh, in its, in its uh, uh, environs. And then on April 4th, a few days earlier, Northampton had already reported that it had received, it's 6%, in three months, $737,000 to be spent as it wishes. Um, and the, those are the, those are sort of, I, I lead the discussion.
Phil has talked about it. We came at this as a medical provider. These are important. I, I believe in this. I know too many people that depend on this, but this conversation is always going to be something to do with the partnership and the revenue contributions that come from a business like this. And th there are the numbers right there that, that Northampton and Leicester have, have received. They'll go down now that more are opening up, but it gives you a, uh, an idea about what a, a relatively a smaller town as they are compared to Southbridge can probably, they're probably thinking of wonderful things they'd like to put in play, the projects, the initiatives, the school programs, whatever it might be. So that's, that's, that's where we are. And then I'll finish up where I know where Southbridge is. Um, and I'm not telling any of you something you don't know, but I, for my own education, it was trying to understand the history of Southbridge and this issue. Uh, and so looking back, that's the map of following the two, 2016 vote uh, in November about whether there should be um, a legalization in Massachusetts. Not, they weren't speaking about municipalities. And that vote, um, I, it's, the numbers are here, they're hard to read here. It was uh, uh, decidedly uh, heavily in favor of legalizing in Massachusetts. That was the Southbridge community speaking in November 16. It was 55% of the vote uh, for, 44.2 against. And turnout that day uh, was a very, very heavy because it was a national election. It was the Clinton um, uh, uh, Trump at the top of the ticket. So there was a very strong turnout, a very strong profile of the city, and it was at 58%. So you had 6,808 voters. That registered number, I, I got that from the, regist the registered voters in the following year. So that number may be slightly off. Um, I don't know exactly what the registration, uh, voter registration was, but in uh, June 17, that was the registered voters that uh, Southbridge had, 11,668. Now, as you all know, you did have uh, a vote in, uh, a little more than a year later in June of 17. That was an off year. Thus, you had a very, very low turnout, 18.8%. Um, uh, nowhere near what you had above in terms of numbers. And it was voted to prohibit uh, retail establishments of any kind in Southbridge. So that's where we stand now. Um, my company is curious about what, this, what the, the town might do next, frankly. And, uh, and so that's what we've tried to talk about today, give you all the, that I've learned, that I've learned from Phil and, uh, and others, um, and to open it up to questions for anybody, and as best I can answer, or more, more probably better, Phil and others can answer about uh, this industry and its effect on small towns like Southbridge. So anything from anybody? Thank yes. you, Mr. Patton. Um, I'll open it up to questions here in a second, but I, I want to reiterate to the crowd that, and to the town that um, the reason why I'm bringing this back up was uh, our extensive conversations we've had. Um, uh, I also saw earlier this, in, this year an individual, or yeah, I believe an individual um, or initiative petition that was, that was going around the town. I also know this vote happened back in 2016, so times have changed in the last two to three years of the mindset of people um, within this community or within the state or in the nation as a whole. Also the fact that, um, you know, we, we have to diversify our economy here in this town. And we can't be so dependent on one or two companies. And I think uh, that's why I wanted to see where our legal stance was at. Um, that would be on the next agenda item. But where our legal stance is at um, when it comes to putting something back on the ballot be it a, a retail store to, to uh, um, I'm sorry, a retail to cultivation to whatever it may be. Because I know there's, I believe there's more than four items um, that are, uh, you, can, you can choose from. Micro businesses, uh, cultivation, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, the last thing I would say is, is, again, we have to diversify our economy here within this town. Um, and uh, just from my standpoint, I'm not a, a proponent of recreational use, but I'm willing to listen. And I've made that very clear before when I started running. And, and even now, um, my whole life has been spent um, trying to keep an open mind about everything here. So at this point in time, I'll, I'll open it up to questions. I do ask that the crowd, any, anybody in here, regardless if you're for or against, be respectful. Um, and then I'd also like to hear from some department heads if they would choose to do so uh, on this as well. So is there any questions right now from the Go ahead, Ms. Paquin, if you can go up to the microphone, please. Just state your name and your address. And also, I just want to remind, there's a uh, sign-in sheet floating around here somewhere. Um, please sign in, and that has to be for everybody. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you for investing in our town. Appreciate that. My company is across the street from you. You're going to be near Mill Street, correct? M Ms. Paquin, can you... Say your name and your sure. address. And Pamela then... Paquin, 16 Thank Ellis you. Road. Hi. <laughs> so 
I think I have a different perspective on this. I spent the majority of my adult life living in Europe, uh, Denmark in particular, where it is illegal, but well known uh, for Christiania, which is a place where they were allowed, people were allowed to consume. Also, obviously, in the Netherlands and Amsterdam. Um, and I experienced an incredibly high standard of living while over there. Uh, I did not see public intoxication uh, from marijuana. It was much more likely to be from alcohol consumption. Of course, their public transport system was much different. Uh, so that is a question that I would have. Uh, but from my standpoint, I think my question would be more to where within the law can we make your facility as um, comfortable as possible? I don't know what's legal and what's not, but I would really like to see people being able to sit outside and have a cafe experience. I mean, that to me, because I'm thinking about people coming in, where do they use it? Can they only use it in their homes? Uh, I'm thinking about Treehouse Brewery. Um, I have a lot of guests that come to Southbridge and they are almost always going to Treehouse Brewery. And I would very much like to see something like that happening here. My brother lives in Colorado. I'm there several times, you know, maybe once a year. It's just not a big deal for me. Um, so I don't have, and I don't use it. I actually personally don't use it. So, but I know what it does to the economy, and I know that it is um, a false flag to say that people are going to be physically ill in the streets. Uh, I'm glad you're here, and I want to do whatever I can to support you, but my, like I said, my question is, to what degree, right now, legally, uh, should Southbridge consider bringing you in? Can, can we set up, even if it's in future, for recreational use on, on site? Um, at, at present, uh, the Cannabis Control Commission has uh, not taken up social consumption. Um, it's not really our intent to have it here. Uh, you know, right now we would tell you there is no on-site consumption. Um, I, I, I really haven't, we haven't talked about it because it's just not something you're allowed to do. Uh, and, you know, it is something that... Um, generally cities and towns are very uncomfortable with right now. We're really interested in getting open on the retail. I, I understand where you're coming from. Uh, I personally, you know, don't find it problematic. I think that's, that's what would eventually come, but it's not. For this company, I think they want to focus on the retail and, you know, somewhere down the line, somebody may want to do that. It's just not something, um, you know, that, that we really want to get into at this point. Um, Sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, these uh, we didn't. Do you, you want to do that? That's that's great. You've heard me enough tonight. Your your point about that. It's almost. I don't even. I, I can't even go there in my mind. I understand what you've seen and all that. But I would say this right now. It's it's not something. The CCC's there. The, my thought is this. As I say, it's not remotely in my consideration, but the host community agreement is the determining element. The, the host, it won't be up to Green Meadows or any other. The host community will say, this is what we want, this is what we don't want, and uh, that, that's who we have to conform to, and we would honor that. But, but it, again, it's, I appreciate you coming, and, uh, and Amy can talk a little bit about the experience that we're building into our building, because we want it to be a, a destination where people want to come, not feeling that they're in an airport line and out of there. So, so please, right. medical and... and no, great. Your question was great. I'm Amy Shar Wildman, and I'm uh, excited to be here and with this team. By the way, this is a great opportunity for me, and I just think it's it's just you know great for this town. Um, most foremost, what we want to do is this the right way, and you know working with Phil to make sure that we are in compliant will allow us in the future. And this is an industry to potentially explore things like that in the future as long as we do it the right way, which is again, what my job running this dispensary is going to be. We want our customers to be able to come in and know that they um, are being heard. They, if they have a, a medicinal license, they're going to be our priority. 
um, and we want to make sure that they are consuming and, and getting their prescription filled the way that they want to get it filled. There's some people who are going to need some special consultation. We can pull them aside. We can have these private conversations. Some people just are going to want to come in and leave and come in and get out. So we want to provide them with you know, comfort, with security, knowledge, professionalism. We want to make sure that again, that they are getting their prescriptions, they're getting their product the way that they want to get it, they're being educated on it. Phil has talked a little bit about uh, making sure that our consumers understand what we are responsible for doing for them, um, compliant with the law. So another part of my job is going to be training our staff, uh, as well as training our consumers that are coming in to buy this product on uh, what it is and how we are going to provide them with this product. They need to be knowledgeable on what it is, what they're providing them. Um, so we're going to be working very closely with our grower who's you know, going to be helping us to educate our staff. So again, I, I have to answer that question by saying that we want them to consume the way that they want to consume um, in, in terms of getting their prescriptions filled. We want them to feel safe. We want it to be a professional environment and uh, everything has to be done by the letter of the law. Oh, well, hold on a minute, Ms. Paquin. If, if you have, no, no, no. If you have a question, please get up to the mic and, and go up there and ask the question. That way, everybody can hear or hears it. Thank you. Um, I'm just thinking about local job opportunities, and I was wondering what the degree equivalent would need to be for somebody who would be working at the dispensary. I'm, I'm just not familiar enough with the industry. In terms of um, their educational background, um, I don't know that we would necessarily say that they had to have. Um, a degree in any type of capacity, not necessarily. Correct. However, um, we are going to hold different standards for our managers and our admin staff. Um, there's going to be an extensive background check for all the employees, which is very important. Um, and uh, you know, for us, it's the people that are going to be running these dispensaries need to have you know a certain educational and professional way that they handle themselves. So, but in terms of, you know, flat out, do they have to have a certain degree, pharmacological degree, something like that? No. Can I just follow that education Yeah, so we, uh, go ahead, Ms. Paquin, but I want to make it cl clear to the crowd um, or the audience real quick, we do go by Robert's rules. So you do address up here so we can hear you. And then what we do is then we pass it on to the next per the person, the subject matter expert, to be able to answer that, or maybe I can answer it, or one of the members up here can try to help answer your question. Great, thank okay, you. Thank you. Go ahead. I'm, I'm just aware that at UConn, they are starting uh, educational classes for people to major in managing the cannabis industry. And I'm quite keen because, as you may know, we have uh, a college in our town, and I would like to know if perhaps as the industry grows, you might consider partnering with our college to help them enter the industry? Great questions. <clears throat> Chris Awaki, CEO of Green Meadows. Um, so absolutely. So just to answer a couple of your questions and, and that last one along with it, um, th as we've talked about the numbers growing, the consumer experience is going to ultimately be what different differentiates you in the market. Uh, right now, there are very few locations. So everybody's kind of winning in our industry, meaning traffic is there, consumers are buying. Longer term, the consumer experience, the customer experience in the store is really what's going to win. So we're investing a lot um, in the decor, the ambiance, the feel, the professionalism. Um, and so a lot of that uh, um, obviously ties back to the, to the staff that you hire. Um, and so that's certainly foremost in our minds in terms of um, professionalism and, and how um, our staff will communicate and present themselves. And certainly, we're totally open-minded. So we, we've already talked about uh, up in Hamilton um, doing some R&D uh, endeavors with um, universities up there on the cultivation side. Um, we would absolutely be open to that. So we're the type of, of, of firm that will um, entertain any idea that will better our company along with the community. Um, and those around us. And the last comment I'll make, um, in terms of Massachusetts, I think your original question, Massachusetts has kind of baby stepped their way into this and, and over-regulated it, which I think in the end will benefit, and I'm comparing it to the West Coast, uh, and I think Massachusetts is ultimately going to set the standard for future states that want to jump into the recreational legalization of it, um, because the market will mature, I think, at a more measured pace 
um, as opposed to out west, and you've seen a little bit of chaos out there and how those markets have matured and, and the environments and, and the number of stores that opened and, and um, how they treated their customers. And I think Massachusetts is doing uh, the right thing, which is uh, making it very difficult, tedious, uh, expensive to get into the industry, vetting the groups that are able to uh, break through and actually operate, and I think that's going to ultimately benefit the communities. I appreciate that, and thank you for the questions. Uh, anybody else have any questions? Councilor? Thank you. Thank you, folks, for coming tonight. I appreciate it. Um, if you'll forgive me, I'm a little bit of a rookie at this. Uh, this business. So um, the, the questions I'm asking seem elementary, please. I'm sure I'm asking for people in town, though, as well. Um, what's the difference between adult use and medical besides the tax? Uh, it, it, it is largely the same products. Uh, medical does allow you to have slight, uh, higher concentrations of THC, but uh, it, it, largely the products are the same. And the reality of this is um, there's a lot of knowledge that's out there that we just don't have on medical. Uh, I can tell you I got into this because uh, my father-in-law is a doctor at Mass General Hospital who, who, who was a, a drug maker and he wanted to open one of these things and asked me to help him do it and I did. And what he'll tell you is you know all the people that say that it cures nothing are wrong and all the people that say it cures everything are wrong as well. It's somewhere in the middle and the federal government needs to let them do more research about that. But a lot of what goes on right now with these dispensaries is we collect evidence, we, we talk to patients and say, you tried this strain last week um, and how did that work for you? Did it, did it solve the problem you were having uh, you know, with not being able to sleep? And we take that information so that when the next patient comes in we say, we've, we've had you know, patients that have told us this will work really well for you. So, all of the products um, are the same, but it may be that a particular strain of the plant or a particular blend, because you can take the oils out of this and you can separate them. So, you know, there's a thing called CBD, which is, THC is what most people know about. It's, it's what makes you high. Uh, CBD, cannabidiol, is actually pain relief. It doesn't make you high at all. And that's been shown to, to do a lot of good for people. And the reality is, um, in a lot of cases, just taking CBD alone, you actually need a little bit of THC too to get the desired effect from a medical perspective. And so, what, so there isn't a difference in terms of saying, oh, that's a medical product, that's not. It's the individual sort of figures out what works for me. Maybe I need a high THC, low CBD blend or a high CBD, low THC blend. You find out as you go along and you work, we educate all of the people that work here about these issues and we, give, we continually update the information on what's working for customers. They gain a knowledge base and they pass that on to patients. So you're always finding out, you know, what works for this uh, particular ailment, what doesn't seem to work, you know, what can we recommend. So uh, I, I wish I could tell you this product is a medical, this isn't. It's not quite so simple. There's a lot of uh, anecdotal evidence um, because we don't have actual peer-reviewed studies um, in academia yet, um, but you know we're, we're finding all of these things out so that we can make really good recommendations to patients on the medical side. Thank you. All right, and if I may, um, while you're there, uh, can you talk a little bit about the uh, the mitigation fee? And is there some talk about that changing in the near future, or how it's calculated, or sure, that sort um, of thing? So this has been a, uh, a, a bit of an issue in Massachusetts. Uh, the law, Chapter 94G in Massachusetts says that um, towns can uh, charge up to 3% as a mitigation fee. Um, and the idea is that it is supposed to mitigate actual impacts of having one of these businesses um, you know, operate in your community. Uh, the truth is, when I talk to clients in Colorado that, that they don't have a mitigation fee of this nature, they kind of think it's funny because they say, we're like every other business. There really aren't these types of uh, impacts. Um, you don't see any real uh, significant police activity at these places. There's not significant monitoring. The state does a lot of the monitoring and, and the inspections. Uh, and I think you can do, you know, you may have your Board of Health be involved um, you know, in monitoring these things. I think that's fine. And there's obviously a cost to that. There's a cost to working with your town officials. So I think there are some 
impacts, but they're by and large not significant. So, you know, the 3%, we used to in the medical try to negotiate that with people to get something below because it's, you know, it's a significant fee to a company when you especially consider that prices are going to come down in the future from where they are right now as there's more competition. Uh, but um, 3% is supposed to be the limit, and quite frankly, we tell all of our clients, don't get into it, agree to pay the 3%, pay the maximum. The towns don't know yet right now what the impacts are going to be. We shouldn't be telling them we know it's less. Let, you know, we'll all figure this out. It's generally a five-year agreement. We'll go for five years, and then we'll figure it out at that point. Maybe, maybe we lower them. Maybe we don't. Maybe we find out there are uh, significant impacts that need to be mitigated. But it is a 3% limit. There have been towns that have um, viewed it somewhat differently, shall we say. Uh, they've decided to, uh, they, these companies cannot operate without a host agreement. And so they've decided to use that leverage to say to companies, well, we also want you to pay this much money to this and this much money to that. And uh, companies have not had uh, the ability to say no in a lot of instances uh, because you're not going to get licensed unless you get a host community agreement signed with the town, and so they've done it. I think there are significant issues with that. I'm sure your town council uh, has looked into this. They, I know there are certain um, municipal employees that take a different view than I do on this. Um, they think it's perfectly appropriate to have other fees other than the 3%. I don't, I don't think the legislature put that cap on uh, so that you could just find other ways around it, but this company is willing to pay, wants to pay the 3%, and they will commit to other amounts, just as they did in medical. And as Bob said, they can do that, um, you know, it's, it, on a voluntary basis, they can put into the host agreement, yeah, we can provide these additional contributions, which quite frankly are a lot more significant in the adult use market than you could afford, I think, in the medical. If I may continue. Yeah. Um, offhand, do you know, is there a limit to the number of licenses that are issued to people and companies and municipalities similar to liquor licenses or? No, the, the, by and large, they let the local communities decide. They, they, there was a point uh, early on when the medical first rolled out where the state sort of took it upon themselves to decide, here's, you know, we'll give out this many and we won't go beyond that. Um, and uh, faced a great deal of litigation over that uh, when they did it, and they said, you know what, all we're going to do at this point is make sure these people are competent, understand the regulations, that, that'll be the way we separate those who get a license, those that don't. Beyond that, we leave it to the local communities and the market to figure out uh, how many of these businesses they want. Great. Great. Super. Um, I'd just like to compliment Mr. Patton and um, his company. It sounds like they want to be really very good uh, citizens in town and uh, you know just just what you're talking about with the extra lot um, how you've considered the town to begin with how you've been here a few times and really taken the time to investigate what it is that's happening here um, as the owner of the company you're really putting a lot of blood sweat and tears into it and I definitely appreciate that so thank you uh, and I would just say right back at all of you um, uh, Phil has identified, I've become kind of irrational about Southbridge. I really, <laughs> I like this place and I like everyone that I've had to work with. I realize there are challenges and brighter minds than me are saying, Bob, this is going to be a challenge for you, but I, I just think that um, we can get through this together. Um, uh, and, and that's really what motivates me to bring this here tonight at your invitation. I do want to mention in the staffing question, um, uh, and those who know us and I think that have heard me speak before, we, we one of our Family's big issues. One of one of the things that in our in our town where we are have our cultivation um, is first of all we're organic uh, in a very serious way. Sustainability is very important to us, and representing that in, in all aspects of our business, we're also very much about diversity hiring. That's really important to all of us as a group and to myself personally. Um, but also we're very much um, about uh, helping and doing what we can for our veterans, um, both in charitable initiatives from you know revenues that we have, but also in terms of hiring. Um, and we uh, will always uh, welcome uh, a veteran applicant and, and uh, try to find a way to make him or her uh, fit into our, uh, our team because uh, we welcome that and we owe them so much. Any other questions? So, okay, sure. Go ahead, Ms. Paper. Yep. Sorry, I'm still wearing my farm clothes. Um, 
traffic flow. So I know the site where you're, where you're building the building, and I'm thinking about traffic flow and also where are other medical dispensaries in the works currently, so how do we catch people coming to and from, well, I guess from work mostly, I don't know how, when people do this stuff, but you know what I mean. I want, I'm thinking about the traffic flow in terms of getting people going between destinations and where, is there somebody five miles further down the road that's going to get those customers first? That, that's what I'm thinking of. Sure. Chris, can you put the, the, the lot back up? Um, the question was about traffic flows and something that Chris just mentioned. Right now, adult use marijuana, medical's been here a few years, but adult use marijuana is kind of a novelty. And uh, one, I don't want to disparage any of other companies, but some are more sort of customer friendly than others. Um, and you don't need to be particularly careful. If, you are, if you're selling adult use marijuana, the demand is there. Uh, but that's going to change over time. And there will be those who have a better experience, both number one for the medical, people that come in that need privacy, that need uh, an intimate conversation uh, with, with, with a trained professional. Um, but why would, why would someone drive to, let's say, Southbridge when maybe in the future there's a place in Sturbridge or in Charlton? Why would they come? Well, the reason they'll come is because we want to make our place special. Uh, the decor is important. It's gonna, it, 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 I think I missed my calling. I should have been an interior decorator. But I like uh, making the decisions about um, you know, the floor and, and, and the wood and, and the lighting and, and all that. That's important. Um, and, and, and it all has to be with the, the number one primary overlay, which is medical care and security and safety. So you have to meld the two. So why would people drive the extra bit of mileage to us? Well, over time, because because it's a nice place to come and, and, and one feels welcome and one feels um, honored and, and treated right and always within the idea of compliance and regulation. It's that double, that double challenge that, that any business like this has to have. So that's our goal, to be a destination. And we're, I'm hearing very excitedly about some of the businesses that are in the area. Of course, I'm, I see Peter DeVorge over there. I'm a big fan of fins and tails, as it is. Um, but uh, we've talked to business owners, not all. I've, I've evidently missed a few. Um, and the idea that we can somehow partner and bring people into Southbridge for all kinds of reasons, maybe not us, um, but uh, wouldn't that be great? And that's one of the reasons I'm really excited about this parking, um, because we have a lot, but we have this other 35 spots that, that we hope to put in with a lovely walk around it and clear that whole area down here, which overlooks the water, which has frankly been left to kind of negligent for a while. Clean this all up, maybe some benches to sit um, and behave properly, <laughs> of course, um, believe me. And, um, and again, one way coming in off of Main Street, the two way at Canal, um, and I hope that it benefits everyone around. And as I say, when we're not in business, we'll need to protect our security around here, of course, but this parking, we won't need it. It'll be available, uh, and I think it would be exciting to see that filled up every night and uh, people coming in and, and piling into restaurants and the, the clubs and whatever else they're doing. I mean, this is, I, I think this could be really, really pretty. And, uh, and the fact that we were able to, to pick it up uh, at this week as well, I'm just really excited about it because if we have parking issues, that will help in the beginning. We, I don't want to disrupt other businesses. I want to be an enhancement. But over time, this will be something available to all of us. Uh, and, and so, again, this was something we jumped on when we saw it. And hey, we got to take care of an old tax lien that's been, uh, you know, that's been unpaid for decades. And, and just so, uh, we appreciate that. Yeah. Well, listen, it's <laughs> we got some other property. Oh, if you shoot, need go, it. Chris. Go uh, one other um, answer to the question is, um, and hopefully we'll be able to market this, <clears throat> but is the brand. Um, and a huge part of the brand is the product. So remember, it's legal, it gets tested, um, it'll be labeled with the quality of the products, and we hope to build our brand around the, qu the, the, the quality of the product, which comes from uh, a greenhouse uh, up in Hamilton. Most of the grows in Massachusetts are indoor. Um, we think there's a differentiator when it's sun-grown product, um, and it's all organic, and there aren't very many organic growers either. So we're investing in that, in the cultivation extraction facility, um, hoping that it, it means more for our customers at the back end uh, in terms of the, the quality and, and their, their interest in it. So hopefully people will come to us. Rosemary, you had something? Thank you. Good evening. I'm Rosemary Scribbins, the Director for Economic Development and Planning for the town. And I, I just wanted to make a comment um, that I just feel that the town is very fortunate um, for... Uh, the, the integrity and the character of um, the folks that have come before you tonight. Um, 
you know, as, as you keep reading and hearing about this industry is spreading, you know, across the state and across the country. And um, in my opinion, what better first um, marijuana facility for um, Southbridge to have um, but this one where, of course, there's plenty of money to be made, but I think there are other motivations um, with this this company. Um, as you know, they have a lot of experience with organic farming and um, decades and decades of working with veterans and helping them. Um, and I think um, a lot of the inspiration for this came from those places as well. So I just wanted to comment on that and say that I, I think, you know, we're just fortunate to have a, a company of this um, this kind of integrity to be our first first company of this sort. Thank you, ma'am. Councilor Jovan, did you? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you again, Pat and your team, for being here. I appreciate the additional two individuals that you brought, especially the legal representative, to give us a little bit more insight into what's going on in the state. As to um, if Southbridge were to consider uh, going to the recreational route, and your company decides to put a license in for that and, a host, and we negotiate a host agreement. Are, are you, is your farm in Hamilton going to change to the recreational grown too, or are you doing recreational grown as well? Because I thought it was just medical at first. And we are indeed. We are, uh, Hamilton is a medical only town, but we have an ability as a fairly large producer of organic to go to uh, other grows that are doing both and they're under strain with the adult use where we can, can give their medical product. We're already having these conversations and memos of understanding with other providers that in their growing facilities they can do both and so we can we will find legal product we'll wholesale it out in other words um, uh, and and still be able to we have a lot more leeway um, as a wholesaler to, to strike deals with other medical providers that they may have um, pressures to provide adult use to their adult use establishments we can give them medical for that and then they can send their adult use to our establishment so we that that will be on us to figure that out but there will be an availability um, uh, that we'll have to take care of and of course it's all legally um, you know on the up and up right. no, there was no given your integrity. Another, uh, you uh, just to add, uh, Jack, um, yeah. uh, the state right now, there's a provision, and we are medical grow only in Hamilton, and, and that's all we plan to be. Um, there's a provision where you can distribute your medical product to your dispensary, and if it's co-located, you can, at the end point, the dispensary, shift it over and relabel it as recreational. As Phil said earlier, the product's the same. State doesn't care as long as it's tested. So the, what all the companies are doing now is they're, they're because they're, mo they're, they're mostly just medical grows, they're shipping the product to their co-located facility. When it arrives, it's labeled as medical. It shifts over at the, at the dispensary, relabeled as recreational, and then put on the shelves. Okay. What? Yeah, and tax changes and, and all that. Tax um, as to the facility and uh, the building that you, you hope to build uh, to do the special permanent, uh, which I think will do wonders for that area. Is that going to uh, size capacity? Are you going to change the scope of your size if uh, it was to be co-located at that, or you have the capacity to, to do both based on your building plan? Our building, how many points of sale? It has a number of points of sale inside without being too crowded. We want it to be very comfortable. We'll have an ability to, to monitor that. A lot of um, pre-ordering is coming in where, where uh, uh, people can call in their, their menu uh, item uh, from an online. They have to be still checked in, all the security applies, but it makes things go a little bit quicker. That will be um, uh, the, the, the technology is available to move people, even with the care that's required by some, to, to be able to, to handle that. But 3,500 square feet will be plenty to do, to do what we do. Again, this will taper down. Uh, there won't be the mad um, uh, sort of influxes that we've seen when there's only one or two or three going. Um, so we should be fine in that category, uh, Chairman. I will add, um, we're, uh, we have a host community agreement in Chicopee as well. Um, part of their requirement was that it would be a co-located facility. Um, so we're designing that as well from the ground up uh, for operational financial efficiencies. Uh, we're designing the buildings to be almost exactly the same, helps with branding as well. Um, so they're, they're being designed to, to facilitate both. And there isn't a major difference uh, in terms of the layout. Um, so they can accommodate both. Thank you. So um, just finally a comment. Again, thank you for being here. You've certainly given me a lot to, to think about and consider as, as we uh, move forward. Um, I, I think one of the couple things that stick out to me, uh, the comment that prohibiting does not keep it out can't be any truer. Um, the fact that other towns around us are going to move to 
uh, sell recreational marijuana, um, and uh, we may be losing our ability to compete with uh, those neighboring towns. And, and the thing that strikes me is uh, our, na our neighbors uh, may benefit on recreational marijuana, and we're selling them the water to feed their product. Uh, similar to breweries that they have out there that we don't capitalize on uh, a lot of. Uh, so it really is something that we have to take a hard look at. It's interesting the, the question as to the overwhelming majority of the residents in the town wish to legalize marijuana, but yet when it was a prohibited use uh, or the pro prohibition, how it flipped. And I'm not sure how that happened. I've heard questions about the question was confusion, but I'm, I'm not sure about that because I've read the question and it says, shall the town prohibit? I'm not sure if that is um, confusing or not, but now we have to reflect and I don't know what the chair's uh, intention is as to how we would move forward. I know that several residents have put together a petition uh, to try to move this forward. Uh, I think uh, we have to see how this would Maybe personally, I wouldn't just vote on it as a counselor to uh, just do it. I think it would have to go back to the, I believe it should go back before the voters uh, to vote, but it just, how that process would go forward, I'm not sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Chiefs, did you have anything at all that you wanted to comment on? And not throw you on the spot as you just sat down. <laughs> well, one thing, you know, and, and I didn't want to keep you guys too long on this, uh, you know, uh, Chief Woodson, one thing that I just read the other day on January 23rd uh, this year, Governor Baker um, and his team have, uh, and I saw that on one of the slides about uh, municipality police training. And I would assume that may uh, literally go over to the fire department possibly down the road as well, because uh, they see, uh, you know, same patients in a sense sometimes, uh, or same issues. And um, a couple of the things they were talking about was uh, authorizing courts to do judicial notice of ingesting THC, directing municipality pl police training, prohibiting drivers from having loose or unsealed packages. I mean, there's a, I think there was like 19 items they were talking about. I don't know, I mean, you're the expert in this area. And, and you know, if the town were to send it back to the voters down the road, um, I'm not gonna ask your personal view, but more of the professional side of the house. Right, well, good evening. Thanks for having me here tonight. And just quickly, obviously as the chief, I'm, I'm not gonna stand here and give you my Understood. Personal opinion on whether or not we should legalize it in the community for recreational use or as far as a dispensary. But I will say that, you know, I did my homework before coming here tonight because I'd like to know what I'm talking about before I get up and speak publicly and before I vouch for, for people. And I spoke with some of the chiefs in the communities that this organization has been a part of. And uh, they, you know, honestly, they have nothing but positive things to say about the organization and the way that they're run. But I will say as a community in, in charge of public safety, um, we need to think about these pros and cons to everything, and we have to at some point sit down and weigh the pros and cons. Obviously, some of the, the pros for our community, we are financially um, limited, we'll say, and this will obviously boost the economy and, and doing some homework on this. It gets about three times more, and my numbers might be a little off, uh, on the taxes than alcohol does already. Um, our, my offices can focus on other issues. That's an obvious thing on, on more things that I consider more serious. Dispensaries, and they hit it on the head, it's almost like they were looking at the same research I was. Uh, crime has actually decreased in areas where there's dispensaries, from all the research I can see, and from talking to other chiefs in other states where it's been legal for a while, um, it, it, and mainly because it's more secure. Right now we have a vacant parking lot, and we will have a beautiful structure there with landscaping and trees and plants and, and parking, well lit. Uh, security measures will be in place, cameras, there'll be a heck of a lot of foot traffic or, or so they hope with customers. Uh, the issues with traffic that I originally had as the chief and knowing what my men and women will have to deal with, we've met, we've discussed it, um, and we've decided that coming up West Main Street will be in, in only, be one way only. That was one of my concerns, all the traffic dumping out onto the main strip. I, and again, I don't really think for that area we'll have any major traffic issues with the way the design is presented now. Um, it's, maybe we'll create jobs, I'm not certain about that and how local that will be. Um, and eventually I, I do think legalization will lead to that black market being reduced dramatically. And I know you kind of touched on that already. But of course there's cons, right? 
uh, from a law enforcement standpoint, we have absolutely no measures in place right now when someone's driving high. Nothing. No standardized field sobriety test. You can't even search a car anymore in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts based just on the smell of marijuana. So our hands are tied with that. I've heard some chatter through my association that uh, there's a test being developed in California, and I don't know if the attorney is, is aware of this, a saliva test eventually where if you have probable cause to believe that someone's driving under the influence of drugs, you can test them right on the spot, similar to a portable breath test that we have now. But knowing the way Massachusetts is, that is going to be light. That's years ahead. Every other state in the country will do that. We'll be the last to adopt it. I can already predict that. Another issue is, in, you know, kids between 12 and 17 in states where it's legal, and again, we can twist the data any way we want, but by looking at everything I've looked at, marijuana use is up. It, usually between what I'm looking at, 12% to 17%. 12% in states where it's not legal, 17% approximately where it's legal. So teen use is up. We don't know the effects of it on people, on brains that aren't developed yet, on young kids. And the biggest thing with me is you're putting more of a product um, on, in, on the streets of the community. It's more accessible. It's, it's pe kid, people get a bit to get it much easier. I know it's 21 and over, but again, this substance is, is, is uh, opposed strongly by most major health organizations. So we have to take all that into effect. And I'm not here to, to advocate one way or the other, but again, I'll end on, I believe this organization is a good organization. I've met with them several times. I have no issue with them. I think they'll be good neighbors. They have done everything that I've asked them to do since the day they started uh, talking about having a business here. I know Re Rosemary has vetted them. Um, so I, again, I can't say yes or no, but as the chief, I would say there are the pros, there are some of the cons, at least how it applies to our community. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate it. Thank you. Chief. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Paul Nomden, Fire Chief here in town. Uh, Chief Woodson and myself sat down for a very short period of time today and to discuss, you know, what we were going to say. Uh, I'm going to err on the sentiments of what he's, he's uh, brought to your attention, the pros and cons. I'm going to say pretty much the same exact thing. But I do have two points to make. I did uh, look at our database for EMS transports and responses over the last uh, couple of years. Um, there's very small amount of documentation of uh, overdoses and uh, emergency room trips with marijuana noted in the chart. It's more of other things, alcohol, PCP, heroin, as we very well know, is very high in our, in our, in our town, in the towns around, around us. Um, so I think right now with the data that's showing, I, I think um, at this point we should move forward with this project. Uh, I have met with Mr. Patton and his team. I think this is probably the fourth time I've seen the presentation. Um, each time it's the same story, and I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm saying that it's been very consistent as we move forward. Um, I do have one question for them um, in regards to the recreational uh, ability for the town to do recreational. Um, would you, if, if you're doing medical marijuana right now, are you still going to continue to build the site even though uh, recreation is not available in town? Phil is going to throw something at me, I think, if I, if I answer this question honestly. But I, I want to build our facility here. Um, it's really expensive. And Chris, too, uh, who is also is, is enamored of, with South Bridge Zion, but we want to, Chief, uh, we want to build it here. Um, it would, it would help our company if, if, if adult use were coming, I think, because we will have pressures to deal with. Um, that's not your problem. That's our problem once we make the decision, and we have made it. As I say, we're going to execute on this. Um, but that, that's, that's the answer. We, we want to be here, um, and uh, it, it'll be a challenge, but we want to be here, and we'll, 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 we'll make it work. But as I say, it, it, it's something that it's not so much the Green Meadows. We'll have the Jicopy, um, which is a, a dual capability. Um, uh, and we'll have the, with a, with a significantly large organic grow, we'll be able to um, wholesale to people uh, with medical and the fact that they'll be needed to provide rec out of there. We'll, we'll be able to participate in some degree to that, but um, the, this, this, the, the influence on Southbridge of what this might be in a positive way is, is going to affect Southbridge every bit as much as Green Meadows. Um, so it's really a town decision to, to, to look at it that way, I think. Um, so. That's how I feel on that one. If I could add one thing, it was a question about um, how many, limiting how many came into town. I think if Southbridge were by the council deciding or a voters deciding or whatever, 
if, if, if the rec ban were lifted and then we would then start our application, technically others could come to the town and say, we, we've read your zoning, whatever the, the new zoning would be. That goes to the, to the host community agreement. The town will then decide, is it in our interest to have another or to not have another or whatever. So that's, that's again a question. There's no law that says you then have to let everybody in that comes or nobody. So it's purely where it should be back with the town and its, and its leaders to decide if, if others are, are, are coming on the same basis. So I thought that was important to say. It's not a deluge if it happens. It, it, it's up to the town to say, maybe we can do another. This is years down the road. But that, again, the local community has the, has the say and its leaders. Thank you, Mr. Patton. I was actually gonna bring that up in the next agenda item to discuss because of the the, uh, the uh, 94C, what it state or 94G, what it states in there uh, about bylaws, and 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 that's one of my concerns uh, down the road would be: does it open the floodgates or does it not? But we we need to seek, you know, uh, in my view, um, um, advice um, on how we go about doing this because we are in a little bit different category. Um, I mean, even it states it in here about prohibiting operations of one or more types of marijuana. Uh, it goes off of 20% of your alcohol licenses that you have in town. Um, so it goes back and forth, and those are the concerns that I have um, that I don't have the answers for, um, and nor do I don't think anybody up here does. So, um, Phil, if you want to answer that real quick. So the way the 2016 law was drafted is it, it sort of separated you into two different groups, those that voted yes on legalization and those towns that voted no. If you voted no, uh, the idea was, well, I'll start with if you vote yes. If the town voted yes, the idea was you shouldn't, once, once the town's voted yes, it shouldn't just be five people or three people at a board of selectmen that get to say, no, we're not going to have it. So they said you should have a town-wide vote if you want to either ban it or limit it to less than 20% of the number of liquor stores, okay? If you voted no, your board can do it or whether, whatever your legislative body. But if you said yes, which this town did, um, then you have to have a town-wide vote if you're going to overturn that, that yes vote in 2016. So if you wanted to, I, I don't know how many liquor stores you have here, um, but if you wanted to limit it to less than 20%, you could limit it, this board could limit it to more than 20%. If, if, if Let's just use numbers. Uh, if there were 10 okay, and you wanted to uh, have three, this board could just say, we'll have three and no more than three, and you could do that. If you wanted to have only one, you'd have to have a town-wide vote to limit it in that way, or to prohibit it for that matter. Um, and you also have to pass zoning in addition to that. Uh, I, I believe there's, there's some uh, question about that. We can talk to your town council about that. Sure. But the, ba the basic law is, if you want to limit it to less than 20% of the number of liquor stores, you have to have a town-wide vote to do it. Thank you. Eric, did you have anything at all, or, or Andy at all? Um, I know Andy just walked in on this uh, after the presentation. I know you, you had a long meeting downstairs, so. Uh, yeah, a very robust meeting, I'm sure it was. So Eric, Eric is our new town uh, planner, and. Um, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, Eric Rumsey, town planner. Um, just wanted to let you all know that the planning board will be uh, just doing a preliminary discussion on recreational marijuana uh, bylaws at their next meeting, which will be next Wednesday at 7. Uh, Thank you. Sorry, 6.30 p.m. So, uh, again, it's very preliminary. We're not, you know, nothing will be uh, coming to council for a vote at this time. Obviously, it, it's not allowed, so right. why? But, you know, in preparation, I think it's very important for them to... So, have that, you know, at least something prepared. And I appreciate that because the one thing that I think we lack sometimes is proper planning uh, for the future of our town, if it goes through or not, whatever it may be, that's mm -hmm. up to the voters or, or even to the town council to get the advice. So um, yeah. I, I do appreciate that. Thank you. Yep. Sure. Mr. Pelletier. Just, I brought this up to my board tonight. Um, we, I just got out of a meeting, that's why I'm late. Um, and my board voted to take a when and if type of attitude on any uh, regulation or concerns. I will personally continue to pursue any concerns that the Board of Health or that public health may have and represent them back to my board. But as of right now, the board is taking a wait and see 
stands. Thank you, Mr. Pelletier. Uh, is there any more questions before we go on? Yes, sir. Come on up. Hey, if, again, if you have not signed the sign-in sheet, please do so. It's floating around here somewhere. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, I apologize for my appearance. I saw the agenda as I was getting out of work with my son. So I look like heck and I feel like heck. For the record, my name is Dave Smick, 145 Ridge Road. Almost two years ago, uh, a council sitting where you're sitting uh, made a decision to move the marijuana question to the ballot. Now, it was because the Commonwealth of Massachusetts at the beginning said for a town to consider the use of marijuana, whether it's medical or recreational, that the people, the voters of the town had to decide. They decided, the voters of Southbridge decided, that medical marijuana was okay and recreational marijuana was not okay. Now, I am on record that I am not a, marina, uh, a marijuana advocate. Uh, and I spoke about it almost two years ago to the council from strictly an economic development standpoint. Uh, the wording, uh, and I said this that night of the election, the wording of the ballot question was confusing. It was a case or a question when Yes usually means yes, and no usually means no. And in this case, and on this question, no meant yes, and yes meant no. Uh, for purely an economic development standpoint, my wish was to vote for the usage of recreational marijuana in Southbridge. And as it turned out, the way I voted, I voted against it because of the wording. Now, as a former counselor, I have always had the belief that once the people speak, the question is over until they decide to bring it up again. Now, how we go about doing that, a lot of different ways to do that. I, for one, I don't feel it is council's purview to bring it up and force a ballot question. I think because it was defeated by the people, if they wanted to start an initiative petition and place it on the ballot, let's do it. I'll be the first one to sign it, even though I'm not a marijuana advocate. And I understand the situation the town is in. Uh, you look around the state, uh, the, the towns that are doing recreational marijuana are backing up the dump trucks to fill up the cash. And we could use it in this town. There's no sense in planning or even talking about something that has been outlawed by the people of this town until they say otherwise. It's the spirit of what they did that I stand by also. Now, Green Meadows in building their facility, and I think it's beautiful. If they want to build it with the future possibility that recreational marijuana might be approved in this town, that's their business. As a town, what do we have to say about it? They're going through, or will be going through, the special permit process, and that will be handled there. If that's something they want to do, they, if, if it's something that might require, you know, a larger space, and they, want to, they got the money and they want to spend it, go to it. But I just don't think <clears throat> that it's, it's an issue that should be discussed prior 
uh, till, till the voters of this town say, yes, you can do it. And I understand the planning aspect, but, you know, I think in a, if you want to make a priority list, there are a lot of things in this town that deserve a high priority. One of them, uh, Councillor Adams, you said at the, other, uh, at the budget night presentation, uh, the road issue. That's going to cost more than the building a fire station. And the discussion is minimal that I see on TV. Uh, you talk more about a rail trail than you do about road conditions in the town of Southbridge. Uh, I don't happen to agree with that, but you guys are the decision makers. Um, so I wouldn't put the cart before the horse. Um, at present, and until it's reversed, rec the use of recreational marijuana is not allowed in the town of Southbridge, period. I don't care what council does. Not going to change that. Thank you. And I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, yes, I did read uh, your comments a couple of years ago um, on the situation or on this, this specific item. Um, and I appreciate you coming up here and, and talking about it. Thank you. Oh, did you want to? Yeah, if I could just. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Because I know it was sort of the uh, same issue was sort of raised before that this interesting sort of anomaly that um, you had a, a vote in 2016 and then a somewhat different vote uh, subsequently. Um, as I recall, I think your 2016 vote was 55.6% in favor um, right. and, uh, you know, the others opposed. And that's actually higher than the state. Uh, as a whole. Um, and I would suggest to you, because we've seen this in a lot of places uh, all over the country, quite frankly, when you get one of these big elections at the top of the ticket and you get a broad turnout, the electorate that shows up for that tends to favor this. When you don't have that and you have a smaller turnout, they tend not to favor this. Uh, now, there is some, uh, there are some people that will tell you, and, and I think there's some truth to it, that just because they voted yes on general legalization doesn't mean they necessarily want it in their backyard, in their town. We haven't seen many instances where the disparity is so great that you'd have basically almost 56% uh, saying yes, and then because they don't want it in their town, it goes down to like 48%. I'm sure there are some that that's the case, but I would bet you uh, that, that there's probably a yes vote here if you get the fuller electorate out. I would also tell you uh, that what we see uh, over time in terms of legalization, um, it's going up all the time. Um, you know, it's just about a percent every year in the polls in terms of favoring legalization. And so what was 55 point whatever percent in 2016, I'll bet you has gone up over 56 percent. It's just the way, I, I doubt Southbridge is different than the rest of the country in that res respect. It's just becoming more accepted. So, um, you know, I, I just thought I'd point that out. Thank you, Phil. Council. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you. To uh, one of the previous speakers, uh, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, appreciate your, your feedback. Just uh, want to point out a couple things. Um, the other night, the rail trail, the lengthy discussion was due to the fact that there was a million dollars on the table. And whether we do as the prior sitting council does and throw grant money away or really vet it out. Uh, so if it did take some time, um, that's our due diligence to uh, hammer it out and make sure we make good, sound decisions. To the road issue, my colleagues in this sitting council this year have had extensive conversations, maybe not on camera that the town has seen, but we have brought that up at numerous subcommittee meetings. Uh, have implored the town manager to find money within the operating budget um, to add whatever little money we can, CDBG grants to improve the roads. This sitting council since July has done more on the roads in Southbridge 
than the previous probably five years of sitting councilors. Uh, we are working hard to improve the town of Southbridge and make sound decisions. But I do appreciate your comments. To the fact about the voters have spoken, I agree with that. The voters did speak. The question before us right now is, two years down the road, things have changed, area uh, perceptions have changed. I'm not one, and I stated it earlier, I'm not one that's going to sit here as a counselor and say, I'm going to overturn the will of the people. Because um, it is the people of Selfridge to decide. It's how do we get that vote out. And I do appreciate the fact that it could be an initiative petition, or do we put the, the issue to rest, if possible, as a counselor, um, to put the question back before the people and say, this is the opportunity that you have. We're putting it back out to you and, and to your own point that it was a confusing question um, and that's a concern. Put it back out before the people with a sound written question as to um, whether we're going to allow this or not and let the people decide, not the council. This is not a, uh, a, a seven member board council because we don't have a full council it's a decision. Since July, this council has been taking the lead on a numerous issues, and that's our job, is to lead the town to the future. Um, so however we can do that, if, if, if we're going to just sit here and wait, like kick the can down the road, 20 years for a fire station, let's kick the can on not fixing roads, let's kick the can on not taking care of issues, then we can sit back and wait till maybe a group comes forward and puts an initiative petition, or do we see that this is a potential? And I'm not an advocate for recreational marijuana by no means. I'm in law enforcement, uh, longtime police chief. I share the same concerns that Chief Woodson just said. I still work in police work. The, the ability to get impaired drivers off the road, that is a concern. But as far as economic benefit, um, we see our neighbors going out to try to do this correct correctly and bring some dollars to the town, maybe we should take the lead and see if we can get the question back before the voters and put the issue to bed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. So I want to bring one question before I, I think it would be time, unless there's other questions out here, to, to bring up the agenda number four. Um, uh, one thing that, that Southbridge is, is one of 29 towns, cities within uh, Massachusetts um, when it comes to um, disproportionate impact. Um, it's a bit been identified as one of those, I believe it's 29 towns or communities. Um, does that take any effect on you as a company right here or another company coming in down the road? I know there will be a priority, obviously, um, if they meet certain criteria. Uh, do you meet that criteria at, at all? Um, especially for our town here. Thank you. Um, it's uh, essentially part of the uh, state process is you have to have a plan uh, for impacting areas that have been uh, disproportionately impacted. So the Cannabis Control Commission is going to require the company. It's actually, if, if you happen to be operating in a town that isn't one of those towns that's been disproportionately impacted, you have to choose one that does. That won't be a problem here. It'll be this town. And you have to come up with a plan for uh, ways in which you can assist, whether it's hiring individuals who have been impacted or otherwise providing additional donations to uh, service providers here who deal with individuals who have been Mentorship. disproportionately impacted. So uh, there's no doubt that this mm -hmm. company's going to have to do it. And in fact, uh, what's been being required now is that you're going to have to show the actual um, success that you've had or efforts that you've made in order to renew your license with the Cannabis Control Commission. So they are going to monitor this. This is an important thing to the Cannabis Control Commission. Thank you. Um, uh, any other questions out there before I make any comments? Real quick. Okay. Um, one thing, you know, I've, I've done a little homework and uh, I got to tell you, you know, I, I didn't think I would uh, be able to print all this stuff off, but it's very interesting to read and, and I, I have a better understanding where this town is at at this point. And uh, um, 
And I appreciate the, the department heads coming out here this evening and actually um, voicing their, their um, professional opinions on, on um, recreational, a possible recreational uh, or adult use uh, back on the ballot. Uh, I, I will say as I've looked at uh, the petition that was started uh, a few months ago, um, it didn't reach half of the desired or what we had to have uh, or what they had to have to bring it back to the town council. Um, the reason why I brought this agenda item number four because I want to make sure that what they were saying, including what the general law states, is that we're doing it legally. Um, but just because it's on a petition doesn't mean that um, a legal opinion has been taken on that. And so the first thing that, and I'm assuming here, uh, the town council would do is if you had that 565 votes, we would take it to our town lawyer to review and verify that the question on hand is, is, is valid. Um, we cannot just throw it up there on the ballot. So I could be wrong in that area, but that's one of the concerns that I have. Um, that includes the fact that the town um, decided, uh, the town council back in 2017 decided to put it on a ballot to prohibit it for different areas. And even though the town people spoke back in November 2016, overwhelmingly for. Um, so uh, those are my concerns. That includes, uh, Councillor Daniel, you brought up the point about the, you know, um, can we, can we limit, how do, does the floodgates come open? I also know the host agreement that we do have limits it to five years, and I think that's the max it can be at anyways. So it's a, um, a, the town council along with the town manager and other advisors would allow us to uh, make sure that what we're receiving as a new company or new uh, economic growth within our town is abiding by um, our local laws and that's good for the community. So. Um, and this is why I brought up agenda item number four in front of us to, tonight. So that said, um, does anybody else have any other questions before we go on to agenda item number four? Thank you. Mr. Patton and your team, thank you so much for uh, spending the last few hours with us. This is uh, actually uh, a lot of great questions from other people regardless of the site it was on. So I thank you uh, for being patient and I appreciate that the town people were very respectful of us sitting here and the questions that you do have. So that being said, uh, agenda item number four, to discuss recommendation that town council seek legal advice related to adult use marijuana, specifically adding adult use questions back on the ballot in order for people to vote at future town election and vote to recommend to the council to approve. I have a motion. Second. I have a discussion at this point. I'm sorry? Yeah. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Um, I'm wondering um, about the town manager, um, his opinion. I'm, I'm not, of course, privy to any conversations that council has had, and uh, the manager isn't here tonight. So uh, I'm wondering what his thoughts are on this. I really don't want to speak for um, the town manager, but I will say that we, we have had, I will in a, in a sense, but he can always clarify down the road too. Mm -hmm. um, he's not a big proponent, but he's also, um, he did state that, you know, um, keeping an open mind and see where it goes from at that point. So I don't, I, again, he would have to answer those questions specifically. But just to clarify, his opinion. His personal we, opinion, I would say. No, his, uh, I'm sorry, I, I need to clarify. Um, his opinion regarding town council going this route, seeking legal advice, and town council possibly putting it on the ballot. He hasn't really spoke about it, I would say that. Okay. All right, thank you. Anything else, Ms. Luke? No. Yeah, me. One thing, um, I do remember from the social media that this petition was being circulated and it was being talked about quite a bit. My concern is about the town council putting it up back on the ballot. If they can't even get half the signatures on this petition, then as a town council, and I'm, I'm a citizen, so is the town council really have the right to do that? Um, if they can't even get, I know a town council was very big on the petition, and if they can't get half the, half, and they were doing a big bunny drive like almost every other week, they were there all the time. 
if we can't even get half the, but only 565 signatures are needed, and they couldn't get half of that. Mm -hmm. I kind of wonder, is it really the town, should that be really the way to go versus the town council? And I agree we should put it back on the ballot before anything happens. Right. But if we can't get enough people to put a signature on a thing like that, which is usually how these things come about, I'm a little concerned that they couldn't even get half the, half the signatures on some, a lot of people are very passionate about it and you can't get half the signatures. So I didn't realize it was that low. And they, they ran this thing on social media um, for quite a bit. And if they can't get half, and they open very openly up at Big Bunny and you couldn't get people to vote on it, I'm wondering why it, they can't even get half the signatures on there. Well, I have my own personal opinions on why they could not receive more than half of that. But I will say um, um, that's left up to, inter to interpretation when it comes to that. Um, you know. Uh, they, you'd have to talk to them, and social media isn't always the uh, no, no, forward thing. Um, so, is it leaving it up to the town council to do it? The, the, the whole premise behind this is to make sure that we also receive a, 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 a legal advice for, for future issues like this. Uh, because we are a town that voted no on the second election, um, or the, the second ballot that came out in June, I'm sorry, June of 2017. So. I'd, I would, again, leave it up to those individuals that set up that petition and ask them the questions of where they succeeded and where they failed. And is it up to the town uh, council? You know, uh, charter affords a certain, um, the town council, is, it were afforded certain um, powers, but we also have to be very careful about what we're doing. That's why I'm asking for legal advice at this point in time. Because again, I can look at the petition that I have right here, Mr. King, and, and I'm not really sure if that petition is somewhere around here. It's in one of this pile over here. If the, the actual questions itself were legal. So I would hate to see that if uh, people went out and, and worked really hard for a petition and they actually got those, they received those signatures, and they turn around and it's not even there. It's not even legal. I mean, it's pretty bad oh, at that point. I'm not saying they're saying it is legal or it's not. I have no idea. No, I'm not saying I disagree with the town council putting it on the ballot. I agree with Councilor Jovan that the town needs to vote it, vote for it. And if they vote for it, I'm not going to give you my opinion one way or another how I feel. I think these guys are great. You know, I prefer a Taco Bell, by the way, but I think they're great. And uh, All right. if it goes to the, town, uh, to the town council, as long as it gets on the ballot for the people to vote, Whatever happens, happens. Mr. Chairman, may I ask, yeah, and, and maybe through you to council, maybe council knows the answer to this. Um, well, first of all, why was the, do we know why the question um, was posed the way it was? And is there a standard template statewide uh, for this type of local? So, Ms. LaDuke, I can probably answer a little oh, bit okay, that I'm for sorry. you. And, and uh, obviously, uh, he gets b paid the bigger bucks than I do to answer this question. But yeah, I but will say this. We're not paying for him. He is right now. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Finally, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, the KP, I believe it's KP Law Firm, is the one who suggested this question to the town council, or these questions to the town council, um, and they went with it. I, I have it somewhere okay. in the minutes. Uh, where I read, that's where they um, went ahead with it. Um, so KP Law is the one that uh, yeah, recommended the verbiage. Okay. If, if I'm not mistaken, that's what I read in the minutes. So I, I'm not sure who suggested in this particular instance. Obviously, the wording makes a difference. Um, but there's no standard template uh, statewide that no, cities and towns use. Nothing standard. It's sort of up to you. Um, right. If, it if is. KP Law is your council. They're very good at this. Thing. Right. Um, they are no law. Okay, well, um, but, uh, you know, listen, um, we would be happy to help uh, with that as well, whether that's useful to you or not. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, everybody's learning about this and people are trying to sort of uh, understand the law. And, and I think it's the same thing with how you craft a question on an issue like this. It sounds like uh, the town is sort of gaining a great deal of knowledge as time goes on about what this is about. I'm actually hopeful that maybe some people watch tonight and gain even more knowledge. So I, I, I suspect that you can get a question that, that you know, people can fairly easily understand uh, out there. I, I don't think it'll be that difficult in the end. So, so what I want, it, does that answer your question, Mr. Yeah, it does, up. but it, so my concern is this looks like 
um, and, and this is just my opinion as a resident and a voter. So you, you didn't get the outcome the way right. you posed the question the first time. So now you're going to pose it a different way to try and get a different outcome. I think that's, we can do that with anything in life, sure. where if you ask the question a certain way, you're going to get the answer you want. That's my concern is the perception of, of this. And I agree with you wholeheartedly that that could be the perception at this point in time. Again, I'm not a big advocate of, uh, of recreational use, but, um, you know, there has been a lot of talk throughout town. There has been a lot of the petition try to get started, although they started a little late, um, and a few other things. And um, the first vote in November actually authorized this town to have adult use marijuana, uh, retail, cultivation, all of them that were listed in, in uh, the commission's um, website. So it, it did authorize it. Now, I'm just going to, uh, if you bear with me for a second, I try to give a little bit of history. On November 8, 2016, Mass approved, Massachusetts approved the law regulations uh, for marijuana. Uh, April 18th, um, Gen Gov subcommittee has a meeting, and one of the questions on the agenda was to discuss prohibiting uh, adult use or recreational marijuana. Couldn't find any minutes on that after that, but I'm sure they're out there somewhere. Uh, April 24th, town council meeting, vote um, the questions on the ballot to, to vote for that. Um, I will say it was a seven to one vote. Even the advocates for recreational use voted in favor to bring it to the ballot. I, I, that, I have no idea what happened, but I know it was a seven to one vote all the way through. May 17th, another general gov uh, discussed the ballot question, everything to seem be okay. And then June 13th, and this was, um, this is 2017, the retail, which was question number two. There were 100, uh, 1,159 yes and 989, I think you guys had 987 um, no against, uh, what well, was in favor of prohibiting. Question number three was to cultivation. 1,150 and the no was 990. And number four, question number four was testing facilities, 1,109 in favor of prohibiting, uh, 1,029 against. And then uh, question number five was for uh, production, uh, 1,153 and yes, and 979, 979 no. So I would say on an average, there was about 150 votes in difference. Um, there was multiple conversations being had through the town council from December 18, 2017, uh, during the first reading. Um, and then it read all the way, the third reading was on, for, this is for the bylaw, mm -hmm. mind you. Okay, January 29, 2018, it was a seven to one, and then seven one vote, and then one uh, counselor wasn't available. Um, and that's, that's kind of where it left at this point in time. Um, my personal view, and I would say the professional view of this is to actually take it to council or take it to council to um, seek legal advice on where we lay at this point in time because it seems like there's a bunch of petitions, there may be other uh, areas that want this and we don't know where we're going at this point in time. So, um, you know, even Councilor Daniel brought up the, the, the how many can come in. We're not even sure how that goes at this point. So, I'm not sure if that answers your question anyway, but um, so I have at that point. Thank you. I would uh, just point out, I, I mentioned sort of some of the uh, political dynamics of an off-year election and how that tends to skew these votes. I, I would mention something else along those lines. Um, what you generally have when you have these, you know, petitions to prohibit in a lot of these towns is you have a very motivated group of voters and they're very good at getting their uh, vote out. What you don't have, um, unless you've got a company that's looking to operate, is somebody motivated to get their vote on the other side. So um, I don't think I can prove to you that that's the case here, but I think what I would say to you is, again, given your 2016 vote, I think if you were to do this again, I think it's, you know, it's very common that the companies that are trying to locate in the town, uh, they take up the cause on the other side, which I doubt happened the last time. And they get the information out to voters. What does this mean? You know, is it safe? Uh, how much will it benefit you? And I think you will see a vote much more along the lines of what you saw in 2016 if you have equal motivation on both sides of the issue. 
Thank you. Is there any other questions or discussion? Sorry about that. Can't see that far away. Please come on up, Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Second yes, sir. Time. Uh, point of clarification. The initiative petition process is dictated by charter. If you want to look at the charter, it'll tell you your percentages. Now, whether that's based on state law or if that was local choice, that I can't answer. Um, there's another provision. Uh, I can't remember if it's in charter or in the bylaws. <coughs> that the residents of Southbridge can propose legislation with a signature of 10 people. The only thing that makes this one a little bit muddier is, you know, let's say I agree with that, any legislation that might pop up out of thin air, what makes this one a little bit murkier is the people already voted no. And which I agree, and I think that if it came back on the ballot, it will pass. I sincerely believe that. Uh, it's just that I have a problem, again, dealing as you guys elected officials, and the people through their vote said no. Uh, that's gonna be the, I think that's the million dollar question. Now, Councilor Beck, when we were on, that was many moons ago. Uh, I remember getting versed by MMA, somebody from MMA, MMA, MMA that said, if you want to encourage an initiative petition, make sure it's written that you're going to get a yes vote. If you're not in favor of a particular petition, Word it so it requires a no vote. Now, in a democracy, I don't care. We can talk about percentages all night long. It means nothing. In a democracy, half your people plus one. One vote dictates to you people what you're going to do, what I'm going to do. That's the law. I can sit here and talk to you about percentages all night long has no bearing. Uh, we, uh, at our state election in November, the town of Southridge voted for the use of marijuana. A prior council was vehemently against that. And I am sure they are the ones that dictated some of the wording on that second referendum question. Now, and you're absolutely right, that, Council, that... Oh, no. Out of respect, you were a Councilor, <laughs> and you will be Previously. a Councilor until I die, <laughs> which may be soon. Uh, they had a second bite at the apple. No question about it. They got beat in the state vote, and they had a second bite at the apple, and they weren't going to let that happen at a local election. And that's what happened. And everybody I talked to voted the wrong way. They wanted it to pass. Because yes means yes, and no means no. All I got to say. Thank you. Mr. Servant. It's really fun to have to come up here. <laughs> um, Caitlin Servant, 40 Hillside Road. Um, I was part of the team that tried to get the petition passed, so I thought I would come up and talk a little bit about that. Um, it was not a very organized <laughs> process. Um, I think we really only were at Big Bunny twice, maybe three times. Um, and we did a post office day for two hours in the frigid cold in January. <laughs> I think the time of year made a big impact. I think we started really late. Um, then we were told that we had three or four more weeks than we actually did. Um, so we still thought we were in the running and we were gonna get it done. Um, and then all of a sudden we found out, no, the date had already passed. 
Um, so we had a few events planned um, for that next few weeks that we didn't get to do. Um, I don't know if that information helps. Um, a lot of the people we did speak to did mention the thing about the question being very confusing. Um, I know a few people personally who voted the wrong way um, on both sides, like people who wanted it and voted against it and vice versa. Um, so I just thought I'd give everybody a little bit of that information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What, one uh, comment I want to make real quick in a, uh, is that uh, November 2016, the people did vote for it. Um, and it, it was the town council that put it back on the ballot uh, to prohibit it, which is lawful, uh, which they followed through with. So I understand the perception part, I, I, and I respect that. Um, uh, at, but at this point, um, I would, huh, I'll leave it as that. I'll leave it there. Council. Thank you. My, just my final comment to uh, a lot of questions, a lot of comments made today. I have a day, great deal of respect for Mr. Spick and it brings a lot of history to the table and I appreciate that. Um, and again, uh, can't agree with you more. Uh, it's a voting process and the people have spoken. But then I also hear that um, a lot of people wanted yes. And that's what I keep hearing is the overwhelming number of people in this town that want the opportunity to at least vote on it again. Um, because um, the question was misconstrued or however it was worded, and you're absolutely right. If I go to a law firm, right, in legal opinions, if I go to a law firm and I say I want to fire this person, they'll give me an opinion on that, and I could get a second lawyer in that same law firm and say I want to keep that person, and they'll give me the, the opinion as to why I can keep that person. So um, it's all on how you want to go about it. Um, I think it's just on, on the council end, and, and I, I don't have a vote here at the planning and development. I'm just here as the ex officio. Um, I think at least to have an answer as to what the process would be as to how we get this back out to the voter. No doubt that the voters could go out and get the initiative petition, and that is in the charter. I've read that charter and tried to figure out how do you get this question before the voters. Is it just through an initiative petition? Um, or if you have the uh, people come before you and say, hey, this was confusing, can we get it back on the ballot? How does that go? If it is initiative petition, then I encourage people to go through that ballot process. Mm -hmm. But I think, um, given all the concerns that we have, uh, the question before us is, do we at least seek legal opinion as to how do we proceed given the conflicting votes? I don't want to spend a lot of money on, on lawyers. Um, we spend way too much money on lawyers. Um, but this is an important question as to um, the impact on uh, the economics of town, not just purely a financial uh, uh, factor because uh, there are other issues, but there are a lot of people that have approached us about this and how do we proceed as a council. And that is our job is to, to um, advocate for, the, for our constituents as well. If we have a lot of constituents that are saying, yes, I want another opportunity to vote on it, then how do we act as a council to put it before the voters? Um, or if it is an issue of petition, at least to have that answer to them that this is the process. So I think it's wise of the council to um, move forward to at least get some answers as to how to proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. I'm going to explain my vote before we take it. Sure. Um, so I'm not a councilor sitting up here. I am only a citizen member of this committee. Um, so my I feel that this is the town council's decision to do this. My concern with their decision to uh, put this back out to the voters or not, not a concern, but um, I would rather probably see it done that way with the legal advice and make sure that the, the question is drafted properly. I'm not sure of the restrictions as far as an initiative petition. Once it's submitted, if it's like a citizen's petition at town meeting, we can't touch it. It has to be put on the warrant exactly how it was submitted. So if that's the case with an initiative petition that's submitted, and it, then it goes on the ballot, and if it's found not to be legal, the attorney general doesn't approve it, and it's only found to be um, you know, non-binding, then we're back where we started. So that's explaining how I'm going to vote. And, and thank you, uh, and I appreciate it. And 
Uh, one, one comment, uh, I keep saying one comment, but I will say this is, is under the Mass General Law 94G, it talks about the initiative petition, it also talks about referendum. And when I looked in our own charter about referendum, I couldn't find, and, and I'm not an expert on the charter here, and I think I know somebody that may be in the back of the crowd, but um, I, that was one of those questions I asked uh, Councilor Jovan uh, about the referendum, and it was, it was very hard to understand. Um, and uh, so that's another reason um, the opinion is so important to me at this point in time, to make sure we do it the right way if we're going to do it or not. Um, the initiative petition, I wholeheartedly agree, is one of the strongest ways to do it. Um, but that's all I have. Any other discussion? Yes, Mr. Uh, Council Dan. Um, I'd just like to say that I would like to see um, a ballot question on this subject and decide the question once and for all. Um, I'm hoping that uh, this agenda item does get to Council and that we're able to vote on it in a positive sense. I would like to see legal advice um, echoing the committee member to my left uh, about how uh, we should do it right, do it properly, do it once and for all. Um, I think it's interesting that when you look at the statistics, when 58% of the town voted, the issue was one way by 800 votes going away. When only 20% of the people voted, it was less than 200 votes going the other way. Uh, that's just a huge swing in a six-month period, uh, both in terms of the, uh, the winning margin and in the number of people who voted. Um, my suspicion is, is that if we were to put this on the ballot again a third time, it would be a hot topic and that we'd get a true sense as to what the majority of the people in town uh, believe. And that's what I want to do. I want to do what the town's wishes are. I think there's a, uh, um, a valid interest here on the part of uh, the town. Uh, and I think we need to protect that. But I think we need to go by what the town's wishes are. Um, so I'm looking forward to eventually, hopefully, seeing this on the ballot. That's all I have. Thank you, Council. Any other discussion? All right. All those in favor? Opposed? 3 0. All right. Send right. item number five. Any new business? Once, twice. Motion to adjourn. Uh, Second. All in favor? Thank you.